since we first opened our doors in 1858, Fifth Third Bank has been a champion of dreams. The dreams of mothers and fathers to give their children opportunities they never had. The dreams of small business owners to follow their true passions. The dreams of American companies that build our economies and our communities. The dreams of a grandmother to watch her grandchild graduate to a brighter future. The dreams of retiring and knowing that the best years are ahead. Every day, our customers work hard to pursue their dreams. And in turn, we work hard to turn them into reality. Because when our customers succeed, their communities succeed. And when their communities succeed, we all succeed. It's their passion and purpose that inspires us to never settle, to keep moving forward, and to bring more success stories into the world by making banking a fifth third better. Hello, everyone, and good morning. I'm Stephanie Smith, Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer for Fifth Third Bank, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's 2020 Diversity Leadership Symposium. To say this has been an unprecedented year is a significant understatement. We're still in the midst of a global pandemic, which has interrupted every personal and professional business as usual reality, including this event. While I'd love to welcome you in person as we've done prior years, I'm glad that we have an almost 700 participants in this year's virtual symposium. In addition to the impact of the novel coronavirus in 2020, we saw an outcry for social justice in the late spring. It became clear from those events that it was time for an honest conversation. Under the leadership of our chairman and CEO, Greg Carmichael, and our president, Tim Spence, this third formed the Executive Diversity Leadership Council to reaffirm and reinforce our path for equality, equity, and inclusion. You are in the media. There are more than 408 participants in this meeting. This meeting is being recorded. I think we had some disturbance there. I think we're all getting used to this new environment. So on behalf of the third bank, I will tell you that our first meeting of our executive uh, diversity leadership council symbolically or was organized on June 19th, Juneteenth. And it was very emotional and it was also uncomfortable. Our subsequent meetings were not easy either as probably should be the case when you're dealing with the challenges of racial equality in this nation. They were very productive. And through our discussion, and though our discussions were challenging, they were necessary. Necessary to ensure that we have a workforce that is representative of the customers and communities we serve and ensuring we have an environment and culture that always supports our employees and brings their, allows them to bring their authentic selves to work. We learned a lot into this current environment. But the reality is that Fifth Third has been working on equality, equity, and inclusion for quite some time now. We've been focusing on all aspects of inclusion and diversity with a very comprehensive approach. While we are proud of our progress and past achievements, we also recognize there is much more we can do and much more we should do and much more we can do, especially now. Our chairman and CEO, Greg Carmichael, will share some of these efforts in a few minutes. As a financial institution, we are uniquely positioned to tackle economic in inequities head on, such as easier access to capital for black businesses and home ownership. We are working on these important topics 
under the leadership of our chairman and CEO and the guidance of our Executive Diversity Leadership Council, spearheaded by our president, Tim Spence. This has led to our recently announced $2.8 billion investment with a specific emphasis on Black Americans. Greg Carmichael will share more details in his remarks. Our region is a better place because of diversity. We thrive when we collectively bring our unique thoughts, ideas, and experiences to the table. All of them matter, regardless of race, sexual orientation, gender, or religious affiliation. Equality, equity, and inclusion are why we started our bank and our collaboration with the Chamber 12 years ago that led to the launch of the Leadership Symposium. This is our region's largest convening of thought and business leaders who are serious about making a difference for all in our region as it relates to inclusion and diversity. And although this year's symposium may look a little different and may sound a little different, our goal is still the same, to engage openly, discuss, create, and drive actionable change. We are not where we want to be, but together we are on the journey to getting there. At Fifth Third, we talk about being one bank. As you lean into today's conversations and panel discussions, I encourage you to have an honest conversation with yourself, amongst your colleagues, and across businesses about how you can be a part of the change, how you can be part of the solution in helping our region be the diverse, dynamic, and economically vibrant community of choice. Let's have this honest conversation. Up next, will be Jill Meyer, President and CEO of the Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber. Enjoy the rest of the day and the discussion. Thank you, Stephanie. Programs like this, of course, depend on the partnership of our generous investors. As Stephanie said, in 2008, Fifth Third Bank created this Diversity Leadership Symposium and a little bit later partnered with the Chamber to make sure we could expand the symposium to reach the broadest reach in our community as possible. Fifth Third's commitment and investment is what has propelled the Diversity Leadership Symposium to being the region's premier event focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you, everyone at Fifth Third Bank. This year, they're joined by our presenting investor, Procter & Gamble. Of course, not just a community leader, but a global leader in spearheading the conversations about the importance of diversity and inclusion. Our champion investors, Humana and Accenture, our supporting investors, Duke Energy, Scripps, Cincinnati Bell, GE Aviation, Kroger, Miami University, Skanska, and Jackson Lewis. Our participating investors, Pardon me, Cintas, Cincinnati Children's, Dinsmore, Federal Home Loan Bank of Cincinnati, McGowan Braybender, the University of Cincinnati, and Thompson Hine. And last but certainly not least, our media partner, the Business Courier. <coughs> Excuse me. We are grateful for the investment of all of these wonderful partners and their support to make Cincinnati our inclusive future city. At the core of our work at the Chamber, as you may know, is our commitment to model inclusion in everything that we do. Modeling it because we believe that simply saying it's important doesn't impact realities. Actually changing behaviors and evolving systems is where the crux of equity exists. I'm so glad to see this virtual room so full. Why? because this work requires all of us and it also requires each of us. That is every one of us individually choosing personal behaviors and using our individual and collective influences to change the status quo. Don't misunderstand me. Each of us has a role to play in the work to eradicate racism, bias and injustice. Each of us has a role to play in the work to promote equity and to create our future city. It's important to recognize that each of us has this responsibility 
to reverse the impacts of racism and injustice. It's especially important, pardon me, it's especially important for those of us who have long benefited from a life without the unique challenges that our black and brown friends, family, neighbors, and coworkers have faced. Today is a conversation for all of us as we work, march forward together in unity to confront what must change, to speak and hear truth, and to establish once and for all that for our community, each of us must do more. You came here this morning because you know that you have a unique ability to build a more equitable Cincinnati region. Maybe you're not sure where to start. Maybe you don't know what to do next. Maybe you just need a little inspiration or a moment to rekindle your drive. This morning, you will learn from and engage with people who have lived and varied experiences as Black Cincinnatians, with people who will offer ideas and questions leading to needed action, and with people who are calling the question and delivering differently to create a more equitable community. I invite you to join me in really listening and learning from your colleagues and neighbors. No national speakers this year. Everyone here lives and works in this region and is invested in making our community better. Better for black and brown people, and as a result, better for all of us. As you take the time to reflect, whether that's today or in the days ahead, I invite you to examine what you will do differently going forward. Only if each of us takes personal ownership of solutions will a more equitable Cincinnati become our reality. So thank you for being here this morning with an open mind and a bias for action. Enjoy the morning. With inverted tongue From whence does fulfillment come? And I expel From this mortal shell We are at death a living And what an incredibly powerful video. So few words, driving action. I am Amy Spiller, the president for Duke Energy Ohio and Kentucky. And Duke Energy is proud to be one of the many sponsors of the 2020 Fifth Third Bank Diversity Leadership Symposium. Like Jill mentioned just a moment ago, we know there's more to do. And so we are here committed like all of you to addressing these critically important issues of social justice and racial equity. And I know we will hear some, some very compelling words this morning from our featured keynote speakers, Greg Carmichael and David Taylor. And I have the, the honor this morning to introduce both of those gentlemen to you. So Greg Carmichael serves as the chairman and CEO of Fifth Third Bank Corp ninth largest US bank, US consumer bank. 
And since Greg became CEO, the company has grown in assets to more than $200 billion and is recognized as one of the most innovative banks in the country. Importantly, Greg has shown himself as a passionate and authentic leader on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this year, Fifth Third Bank launched its inclusion toolkit, an indispensable resource for anyone looking for ways to act and lead on issues of inclusion and equity. And just this week, Fifth Third Bank committed $2.8 billion over three years on racial equity, equality, and inclusion. David Taylor, our second keynote speaker, is chairman and CEO of P&G. He's a proven leader with 40 years of experience across many of P&G's core categories and markets. He and P&G's leadership team are driving the transformation of P&G to return the company to sustainable, balanced growth and value creation. Prior to becoming CEO, David was group president of P&G's global beauty, grooming and healthcare sectors. He is a founding member of the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion. P&G has been a global leader on issues of diversity and inclusion for decades. We just watched The Choice, one of the videos produced by, by P&G. Among those is also The Look. These are part of an entire series insisting that we talk about bias. P&G's leadership in this space is unequaled and has inspired countless other companies, including Duke Energy. Following the conversations, the keynotes from these two gentlemen, there will be a conversation moderated by Rico Grant. Rico is the founder of Palooza Noir. He's the executive director of SOCAP Accelerate, which is based out of Northern Kentucky University, and is the architect behind the Black and Brown Faces art exhibit that is currently on display at the Cincinnati Art Museum. Rico's a connector throughout the city, serves on the board of Finley Market, and also advises several startups and foundations in the greater Cincinnati region. He is a proud native of Cincinnati, and when asked why he doesn't consider leaving the city to find opportunities elsewhere, Rico's response is short and sweet. No need, the opportunity is here. So please join me in welcoming our first keynote speaker, Greg Carmichael. Thanks, Amy. You know, it's great to be here with everyone today, even though it's virtually. And I know we're all going to be glad to be able to meet in person, hopefully very soon. You know, at Fifth Third, we see inclusion and diversity as a strategic imperative and integral to the ongoing success of our business. As I said many times, we cannot build a strong bank and a strong business without strong communities. We want our employees to represent the rich diversity of our society and of our customers and the communities in which we serve. Fifth Third strives, we strive hard to be the one bank people most value and trust. We are very intentional on inclusion and ensuring we have a thriving communities that we serve. We want all of our employees to feel valued and empowered at Fifth Third. Inclusion and diversity is a top priority for the bank's executive committee and board of directors. Outside the pandemic, I can assure you, this is the number one topic with our board and when I speak with other CEOs. We are proud of our programs and results but this is a journey and we have a lot more to do on this journey. Simply said, we are committed to ending systemic racism. Being part of dialogue is important, but what's more important to me is being part of the solution. <laughs> so let me share some details with you, if I might. Just starting with the efforts towards our employees. Since 2011, we have been conducting an annual pay equity review, which I think is extremely important. And the last results that we just looked at right now, we have very, very minor adjustments necessary. That's important. We've increased our minimum wage by 50% between 2016 and 2018. We were the first bank coming out of the tax reform. We wanted to pass that value down to our employees to help every employee be stronger and have a higher quality of life. We moved our rate from $12 to $15 an hour for all entry-level positions. That was hugely meaningful for our employee base, which is predominantly at that level women, 
and, and people of color and so forth. So that was important. We then took that from $15 to $18 an hour, which makes us, I think, one of the highest paid entry level hourly workforce. That provides everyone coming in a minimum of $37,400 above the poverty line. That was extremely important to me in our business that we did that. Um, and I can tell you right now, it was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and it's helped us in many ways from retention, our recruiting capabilities, just the talent that we're able to acquire. Um, we've got great employees and we wanna make sure they know we appreciate that. We also hold every manager accountable for advancing the diversity of their team. We take this extremely seriously. Like many organizations, we do intensive succession management, evaluations and talent management discussions. And it's imperative that we see progress across the organization by everyone. And if we don't, we take action. We put personal focus on diversity at the top of the house. You know, from a board perspective, we have one of the most diverse boards in the industry, 33% women and 27% people of color. Executive senior management levels, 25% women, 10% people of color. That's extremely important. Not there yet, but making progress. As I mentioned before, it's imperative that we advance the agenda and it starts with leadership at the top, I believe. And we need to look and, and, and be representative of the people we serve and the communities in which we serve. To that end, we've also established eight business resource groups. These include an African-American BRG, women, Hispanic military BRGs, and many more, all focused on bringing our employees and our allies together for conversation and to help make sure we hear from them and we have their voice and their input as we make decisions going forward. These groups are focused on employee development, community involvement, and business innovation. I can tell you they've been instrumental in helping us guide through some of the challenges we've been faced with. Now, we recently assembled a new diversity leadership council at the executive level of the organization. We wanted to make sure we're hearing all the voices in the organization, right? And making sure we're able to make a collective decision at the top of the house that's more impactful. This has been an important council we put in place. It's charged with ensuring quality and inclusion in our workplace, particularly for our black employees. We have also initiated enterprise-wide initiatives to ensure accountability. We have created an inclusion toolkit to help our employees, customers, and partners to grow from awareness to advocacy. And this is available on 53.com. It's a great resource guide. It provides podcasts, policies, education, movies, books. It's a great resource guide. Um, something we're very proud of. Once again, just a step forward in making sure our employees know where to go for support and help. We've also mandated and ensured that all of our employees have completed unconscious bias training. Something I think is extremely important. October 13th, this year we announced six bold inclusion and diversity goals. As we expand and accelerate our focus on achieving meaningful results by 2025, let me mention a few of these. We complete, we complete unconscious bias training, which is one of those goals, so we're, we're done with that. Ensure that all of our workforce has diversity that matches the markets we serve. We also want to grow leadership positions at each management level for women and persons of color. We want to create a work environment where there is no disparity between race and gender. We want to advance the bank as a leader in diversity and inclusion. And we want to achieve and sustain a 10% supplier diversity spend. Now, approximately six years ago, we established a supplier diversity program that has significantly increased our supplier diversity spend, which now totals about 60 $3.1 million in 2019 and more to go. That was a fraction of that. You go back five, six years ago, we were going there. We've also focused heavily on recruitment to help us develop the talent pools that we need to manage our business. In addition to strong programs and partnerships with local and regional universities and colleges, we have a robust multicultural recruitment strategy. We recruit from nine historically black colleges and universities. And recently we have hired 26 employees from these nine universities. Once again, not where we need to be, but a start. In addition, we've also focused on transparency and data reporting. I think it's important for everyone to know where we stand, what we've accomplished, and where we need to still achieve opportunities. So in order to be more transparent, the bank has just published our inaugural ESG report. That was published in September 30th of this year. The new ESG approach offers a comprehensive view 
the bank's efforts on environment, social engagement, and corporate governance. And this follows years of corporate social responsibility communication and reporting of our diversity data. And by the way, we we're among the first banks to disclose this information. Once again, we want to be a leader in this space. We shifted our communities and taking care of our communities. In 2016, we made a $32 billion five-year community commitment, which is the largest by any large regional bank, bar none. Solely focused on improving the lives and the communities we serve. We have three months left in this reporting process, and we've already achieved $38 billion over that five-year period. Um, significant. The program was fully focused, 100% focused on low-income areas. It's made up of lending, investments, philanthropic contributions, and financial literacy. And we know how important financial literacy is for our communities and our customers. They'll make better financial decisions, we'll do a better job providing for the families. It's extremely important. So a lot of work done there, a lot of great progress. We'll reload that program as we move forward. And as Stephanie and Amy both mentioned, we just announced a $2.8 billion investment to accelerate racial equality, equity, and inclusion with specific emphasis on Black Americans. Now, these dollars are tied to four major areas. $2.2 billion in lending and $500 million in investments, also providing $60 million in financial accessibility, which means we want to put our banking centers and so forth in low to moderate income areas to have access to financial services and products. And it's really focused on the unbanked and underbanked sectors. In addition to that, financial literacy continues to be part of that program also. We committed $40 million, $40 million in philanthropic investments and commitments. The bank has already committed $1 million to the, Na the National Urban League for the Workforce Development Program, which we're very proud of. And we've also established a $100 million neighborhood fund that focuses on neighborhood revitalization throughout our 11 state footprint, predominantly focused on communities of color that have experienced decades of disinvestment. Now, let me welcome David Taylor, who will share a few highlights of the tremendous efforts that PNG has undertaken to address inclusion and diversity. David, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Greg. And I want to thank Jill, Stephanie, Amy, the Chamber, Fifth Third, and Duke for inviting me to participate. I also want to recognize Fifth Third for the significant investment in racial equality, equity, and inclusion they announced earlier this week. And what I'd like to do is just talk with you a little bit this morning about what PNG is doing, and then we'll talk to Rico. Uh, I want to start by saying that there's a lot of events that are going on that have driven to me just a heightened awareness all around the country. And to me, no one has all the answers and we don't pretend to, I don't pretend to. I do believe though, we can all have a tremendous impact. And at PNG, we're very clear. We aspire to create a company in a world where equality and inclusion are achievable for all, where respect and inclusion are the cornerstones of our culture, where equal access and opportunity to learn, grow, succeed and thrive are available to everyone. Just think what it would be like if we had that kind of society. Now in the company, we focus on four areas, employees, brands, our business partners, and our community. We try to make it holistic. And one of the things you'll hear from PNG people, and I believe it's really important, we wanna build it in, not bolt it on as a separate effort. It's part of how we run our company. And I think that's one of the reasons it's working and working very well, because it starts internal. We wanna reflect the world around us. The more diverse we are, and I really believe this, the better we're gonna be able to connect with the consumers we serve. We serve consumers throughout our community and throughout the world. We want a leadership team and a board that looks more like them. If so, we'll be more empathetic and more in touch, more innovative. It'll be a better third way. One of the things we wanted early on is we need to get to gender equality. Think about it, half the world is women. More than half of the world's products in our categories are bought by women and the vast majority are influenced by women. I'm proud to say today, the PNG Board of Directors is 50% men, 50% women. Not surprising, we're making progress. Lead team that reports to me and works with me is 41% women. Our manager team across the world, even in areas 
where it's tough from a society standpoint, we're up to 48% women. Our aspiration though is 50% top to bottom because they're more representative of the culture all around the world. We want it all functions, all geographies, all levels. Multicultural, 28% of our board is multicultural. 36% of our leadership team is. 28% of all of our managers. We aspire for 40% up and down our organization. We're there in a US workforce. We still have work to do though. A few years ago, we wanted to make an intervention with our African-American representation. I remember standing on stage talking about where we were, being transparent, recognizing we are not where we want to be, recognizing we all have bias, we all have work to do. We needed to have tough conversations. We needed to show vulnerability and openness to listen and learn. We recommitted, we developed new goals, objectives and targets, and we're making progress. Our hiring of African-American employees and managers is up. Our attrition is down. Those lines have crossed. Now we're growing representation. Promotions are up. Still not where we want to be, but making progress. And interestingly, as we've made progress in gender equality and racial equality, our company's results have gotten better. Not surprising, because we're getting the benefit of everybody's experiences and knowledge, a broader range of experiences than just I or other people that may look and act like me. The more I can surround myself with people of difference, respect them, listen to them, not wait to speak, but listen for understanding when someone speaks to you, we make progress and we continue to do so. We also recognize in our advertising, we have an opportunity to have such influence. So we decided in our advertising, we wanna accurately and authentically patrol all humanity, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, sexual origin, orientation, gender identity, ability, religion, socioeconomic status, or age. Just think about that. Represent people the way they are, not stereotypes. Don't reinforce stereotypes. Advertising can change mindsets. My hope is many of you have seen the advertising called Like a Girl. Many have. That phrase, Like a Girl, for those that hadn't seen the advertising, was an insult, was used in a negative connotation. After we aired this always like a girl advertising over time, the people that have seen that 76% of the people consider like a girl a positive expression versus 19% before. Advertising can change people's views and we want to be part of positively making a change. We also wanna use our voice to spark conversations because we believe conversations leads to understanding. Understanding leads to empathy and empathy leads to action. Now, over the past several years, we've released a series of short films to bring awareness to some of the challenges our African-American colleagues face. Earlier today, you saw The Choice. Jill played that, which I thought is just one that's powerful and helps you encourage the silent majority to step up and get started. Earlier, we had The Look, which shined a light on the bias that African-American men face. And earlier than that, we did something called The Talk, a conversation many African-American parents have with their children all meant to reflect the reality. It surprised many and we got a reaction out of some, but to me, the engagement has led to conversations, dialogue and understanding, and that's a good thing. We also work with our business partners to drive impact and build support and build diversity. We wanna achieve equal representation in our agencies. We've worked to make sure that in front and behind the camera, we wanna see African-Americans and women and people that represent the broader tapestry of the consumers we serve. We're expecting that of our media providers. When we do that, we can make a difference. We've increased our investment in women-owned businesses, Black, Hispanic, Asian, and Native American-owned businesses. In Cincinnati, we're working to help build an innovation ecosystem with many of you. We're investing time and resources in the startup community like Centrifuge, Signal 360 Accelerator, we want to make, and frankly, I believe, having worked all over the world, Cincinnati is a place where we have outstanding diverse talent. And what they need is an opportunity and get started. And many of us can play a role in that. And certainly for all of us today, we all play a role in making that happen. Partnerships that provide equal access, meaningful business opportunities for minority-owned businesses. Investing in the Cincinnati Regional Chambers Minority Business Accelerator, just many opportunities. The last part of our strategy is to work with a broader community to help drive progress. I've been involved in the CEO action for diversity and inclusion. 
We have and been involved for years with the Executive Leadership Council and the Business Roundtable, which is a group of leaders of some of the larger companies around the country. We have a plan for addressing inequity and injustice. And in Cincinnati, it's important we have a community that attracts and retains younger diverse talent. You know, I'm excited and proud that we sponsor and support the Cincinnati Music Festival, Arts Waves, Salsa on the Square to help a unique cultural connection for all of us. It opens our eyes and we connect with people of difference. We learn and grow. I said earlier, we do not have all the answers. I certainly don't believe I do. I'm in the learning mode and will continue to be. I have the opportunity today and every day to learn from those around me, to learn from other companies, other leaders in Cincinnati and beyond. Collectively, we can come together and have the courage to have uncomfortable conversations. We all have biases. I grew up in the South, had some difficult times earlier in life, and then had some fabulous times with my African-American colleagues, working with women, African-American, and many other people with different from my background. And what I found is when I could listen to people that are different, had a different set of experiences and background, collectively, we came to better answers. It was a path to better results and frankly, a more inspired team. I benefited tremendously from listening and learning to others and believe that difference is an opportunity to learn and grow, to get to better solutions. I believe everyone benefits from an equal world. There was a study done a while ago by McKinsey and they estimated that achieving economic equality among all races and ethnicities would add $2 trillion to the US economy alone. We all know the US economy needs help. What a fabulous way to get there by creating more equality that lifts all boats. Working together, we can create a better world where everyone thrives, where business grows, and where communities like ours prosper. Thank you very much. I wanna hand it off to Rico and certainly happy to have a continued conversation. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd obviously like to invite David and Greg back to the screen so we can have a really, really good conversation this morning. All righty. So first and foremost, uh, I'd like to thank you both for sitting down with me today, sitting down with us all this morning to have, uh, as Greg would say, a very transparent conversation. Um, I think now is the time to do that. It's probably needed more than ever. I'm gonna start today's conversation by reading back a couple quotes to you both, uh, quotes that, that you guys have wrote, written in the past um, to whether your employees or your organization and to me, they stood out as very powerful. Greg, I'll start with you. Uh, first, before I do that, I'll let you know, Greg, that I am a huge fan, man, of your speak up and speak out approach, uh, your big, bold statements. I'm a fifth third customer. I know you're probably happy to hear that. And I'm, I'm so excited that I am a consumer of an organization that you lead and this, in the way that you lead it. I'll read this quote back to you. He said, I call upon all employees to do everything in their power to treat every individual fairly and equally and help us stamp out racism and discrimination in this country. My favorite part of this quote, Greg, is everything in their power. I remind you that today we're, we're followed and listened to and, and, and folks are in their home and at their offices watching us have this conversation and most of them are business professionals professionals who dream to be empowered by their leader of the organization to do everything in their power to help stamp out racism. So I really, I wanna dig in on that part of it, Greg. What did you mean by that? What did you mean when you wrote it? What did you feel when you said everything in their power? First off, Rigo, thank you for being a customer of Fifth Third and thank you for being <laughs> here today with us. It's, it's great right. to see you. You know, first off, that was important to make that statement um, and because it's what I believe from the heart and it requires all of us. I mean, listen, we're in a unique position as CEOs to, to set the agenda, set the stage for different outcomes. And I, I take that very seriously. Um, and if it doesn't start with me, then who is it going to start with? So it was important to get a message out there. And I want people to understand it's a journey. We understand that. But we have to make meaningful progress to stamp out racism. And it's not going to just happen by myself. I need everybody involved. And I want them in power to speak up. That's why we put together that Executive Diversity Leadership Council in place, the BRG groups. I want to hear from them. 
Um, listen, I'm not going to satisfy everyone's request and everyone's demand of, of, of what they would like me to do or like me to say. All right. But at the end of the day, I want the input so I can make a more informed and better decision. And that's what my team's focused on. So empowering them to make decisions, empower them to raise their voice, to raise their hand, and provide that information and support necessary to move the agenda forward for everybody. Um, but it's important for them to know where I stand on this and how important it is to me personally. I appreciate you. I appreciate you placing emphasis on the input aspect of that. I think a lot of times as leaders, uh, we don't we don't drive as much value to that as possible. There is a there is a thing out here, and it's called lead up, right? And as leaders, we we have to be willing to learn, specifically with organizations the size of your organizations that you lead. So I applaud you for that, Greg. And I uh, I'm happy to be a fifth third customer. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll turn my gears to you, David. Um, you know, you're not new to this work. Uh, you know, my friends and I, we would say you've been down for a while now, right? And uh, I think about the initiative that you started back in 2017, where you brought together over 150 firms to, uh, to do a lot of work on advanced workplace and diversity and inclusion. Um, myself specifically with Palooza R, the organization that I run, we work really closely with uh, the My Black is Beautiful campaign on all the intentional community work that we do. So your leadership style is certainly trickling down and I, I applaud you for that. Um, I, wanna re I, wanna, I wanna read this back to you. You actually wrote this to an employee uh, this year. And the quote says, far too often the burden of seeking equality rests on the shoulders of those most marginalized. You said, this simply won't work. The change we need is broad and deep and requires all of us to be active as friends, as colleagues, and as allies and advocates, end quote. I, I, wanna, I wanna place an emphasis. I think my favorite part of the quote is, requires us all to be active, right? And what active looks like. And I wanna talk about what, how you were feeling when you wrote that, what thoughts were going through your head? What did you mean specifically? And why it's so important now as, as it was back in 2017? Rico, thank you. For first, I would say it's more important now than it was even in 2017. We've seen things that have just frankly shooken all of us, that have saddened all of us over the last several years. But go back to 2017 or go back much earlier in my life and my career. I've seen all too often when there's an issue and, and, and the group is either marginalized or not taken care of. We ask the group, what do you want? How do you, what do you want us to do? And the reality is it, it doesn't get addressed or addressed well. Those that have the decision space, the access to the resource and the capability to, to really make a difference first don't understand it by doing that. We stay away. It's safe. It's safe. Because what happens when you open yourself up? What you find out for folks like myself is you don't understand. You haven't walked in their shoes. You haven't lived that life. When you engage to understand with anybody that's, that's frankly been, for whatever reason, uh, it's whether it's been oppressed, not treated fairly as a society, bias has affected decisions. To me, what happens is you open yourself up. You figure you're part of the issue and the way you're going to fix it is to learn and then accept responsibility to be part of the solution. Early on in this role, I remember having some discussions with some of my colleagues, and they challenged me not just to help and support. They said, we want you on stage, behind the mic, in front of everybody, and then say what you believe, and then take questions. No script, no teleprompter, and just open up to what you believe and feel. And I had a, a chance to talk about what it was like growing up in Charlotte, North Carolina, a product of forced busing. I went to a predominantly black school in high school. Uh, I've started in a predominantly white neighborhood in a predominantly white high school. Then there was forced busing in the late 70s. And to me, these are eye-opening experiences. And, and you see good and bad, and you have biases. And it was only until, frankly, coming into PNG where the environment was created to openly talk about what you feel, what you feared, what you believe, that you started to get to know people as people. And then all these titles and labels that get in the way made a difference. And, and I do believe I play a big role. Leadership plays a big role. The passive I support these efforts is not going to make the progress we need. Active engagement, personally leading. My, that's why we aired the last film, The Choice. It's not just being against racism, against any of a number of things that are to cause inequities in our society and system. 
It's about owning the fact that you have a role. If you're in a position, a leadership, any of us, leadership, have access to resources or influence, then you need to jump in and say, if you really are against it, then you do something about it. You don't support it. You're committed and you're intentional. And what happens is people then help you. They recognize you don't know all the answers. I don't have to be right. I just have to work with people that can help us do the right thing. And then I'll learn in the process. So the, the, the idea was many of these individuals have amazing capabilities. They've succeeded in the place of obstacles I didn't face. So if I can learn from them, I'll be a better leader and I can help them with things that I've learned. So the idea was to engage in a, in a real way, not a safe leadership distance, but to be in the middle with them. This is a participation sport. This is not a spectator sport. It's one where we all have to be on the field. And when we do so, we develop, they find the connections that teams have. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, David. You know, the, the, when, as you spoke, the word that jumped off to me, and, and you said it at the tail end of your response is intentional, right? And um, Greg, I'm gonna toss it back over to you. And, and what I really wanna know is, we know the definition of intentional, right? And we're not looking to change the dictionary definition of it, but when you hear it, what does it mean to Greg Carmichael? You know, first off, those who know me well, it's all about execution, it's all about Doing what you say you're going to do, um, and it's it's important. So when I think about intention, I want to understand what those actions are associated with those intentions. What are you going to do? You say I'm intentional. What does that mean? So you know I'm looking for what the outcomes, the actions, and then what the outcomes are when I think about being intentional. Um, when I talk about being intentional with our leadership team, it's always followed by a series of actions, commitments, okay, and then and then monitoring of those outcomes. Because if you're not getting the outcomes you're looking for, you need to make an adjustment. That's what leadership's about. So let's be intentional. Let's be intentional on the right matters, the right opportunities. But let's also make darn sure we have a plan and task associated with getting that done. Um, and I think that's how I think about everything I do in my business. But more importantly, it's imperative that I set that tone at the top for all employees, especially when we're talking about the subject we are, which is inclusion and diversity. Absolutely. You know. Uh... Preparation is key. I think we've all I think we've all learned that, right? Whether it's the hard way or uh, in our role in our roles currently, uh, David, you you hit on something, and you know we talk about systemic racism, and uh, you know Jill and I we have this conversation all the time about the two pandemics, right? And you've got COVID nineteen right now, and you've got all the social social justice issue. But uh, the top of your conversation, you mentioned women, right? And the intentional work behind. I, I think a lot of times, quite honestly, that's that's the gym that we miss when we talk about diversity, more than likely because of what's heightened on CNN and on the news all the time. But the inclusion of women is such a key component. And I'd like to, I'd like to dig in a bit about your mentality of that and that perspective and your approach, to, the, the approach that Procter & Gamble has taken to make that really intentional as well. Rico, if, again, if you, the principle that I'm, we're trying to work against is we want to reflect the people we serve. And you look at it, if, if you want to do that, then why not have a board, a leadership team, and a management organization that does? And to me, it, it's, it gets down to something that it, we, we, we use the, the notion of integrative thinking as a powerful thought, which is the idea you and I respect each other. If we, if we have a relationship, we've known each other. If you have a different point of view, then I can do one of two things. I can try to convince you to my point of view and you can try to convince me to your point of view, which is what typically happens in business and in society. Two people discuss and somebody wins an argument. And people ask, you know, who won the argument? And in another way, the integrative thinking way, which is why it's so powerful to have a diverse team, women, African-Americans, just the broadest array of diversity, is if instead of trying to win the argument, I, I say, help me understand why. And I walk down the, your ladder of inference and, and I understand you accessed three different experiences you had earlier in life and some knowledge you have that I don't have. Then I had the benefit of that. And if you're willing to do the same and say, David, I don't understand why you came to that conclusion. Tell me why. And you go, why, why, why? And you realize, whoa, I didn't know that because how could I know that? I didn't have that experience. We both have the benefit of each other's learning. And what happens then is we often come to a better third way, not your way, not my way, but a better third way, which is why this whole idea, if you don't have to be right, don't try to be right all the time, try to do the right thing. 
And often you'll know something that I don't know. I know you know a lot that I don't know. You've lived a different life. You've had a set of experiences and I can learn from you. I can learn from Greg. I can learn from Jill and have learned from a number of these individuals that are great leaders in our, our community. That whole notion to me opens up. And then what happens, and I've seen it right now in our company, we have six large global businesses that are multi-billion dollar businesses. Three men, three women. What happens? We have our best results in 10 years. This isn't a shock to me. But look on our board. We, we need, the more diverse we've gotten, the broader range to me of vision we have to see around corners, anticipate issues and see opportunities because we have people that have different experiences. To me, there's real power. You learn and you can, do, you can just do so much more. And, and the women that have gotten in leadership roles, the African-American that's gotten leadership roles, and, and more broadly, people with different cultural experiences even outside the country because we're a global company, it, it just helped add so much. I've had the benefit of living in Asia, living in Europe, living in the US. And to me, when I went to China, lived in greater China for a while, I was a minority. I was, there, were, there were very few of me and a lot of people that were different, a very different background. And it was powerful to listen and learn. And you bring that back and you look at the US, it's got such amazing capabilities. People that have heart want to make a difference. But all too often, we separate and we label and then we, we kind of suppress. And what's happening, I think we truly have a societal awakening going on because of the horrible events that we saw, whether it's the George Floyd murder or Breonna Taylor, any of a number of these, I think it's opened the eyes for a large number of people. Small people, small active group may say differently, but a large number of people that say we can be better, we will be better. And now it is time to be intentional and make a difference. And, and I've been challenged by people in my workforce, my leadership, and, and the employee group, the people from plants, and that's great. They have the courage to step up and say, you can do more. And, and that's motivating to me to listen and hear and learn from others. Listen, David, you nailed it. I mean, the reality is, is that the conversation has to take place. And I think that's why we're here today. We, we built the art exhibition at the Cincinnati Art Museum so that the conversation could take place. We used art as the vehicle to allow that conversation to take place. And, and, and there was one thing that I didn't anticipate, and that was the amount of allies that we had join us during uh, the 73 day ex exhibition um, and the conversations that took place in that space amongst non-like-minded individuals, which is okay. I think a lot of times we were afraid of having conversations with people who don't think like us, but that's how we move the world forward. So I really, wanna, I really wanna dig in, Greg, and I'll start with you. Um, how are you empowering the allies who, who work with Fifth Third and work for the organization and, and, and those that you come in contact with and what does an ally look like to you? You know, it's a, it's a great question. And an ally looks like a, a support resource, a support entity that helps us, once again, advance the agenda, move forward. And there's many of them out there. And what we do is we seek in every opportunity to hear from them, listen from them, and learn from them. As you mentioned before, this is a learning exercise. And David said it very well. I don't know everything. You know, I'm never going to be a black man. I just I found that out recently. But I'm never going to be a black man. Okay, so I'm never going to experience the black man experiences. Right? I need to have support around me, input to me to help me see things that I might not see. Right? I didn't walk in those shoes. There's, there's opportunities for me to learn in every corner I turn. There's an opportunity to learn. There's an opportunity for my team to learn. And my team's hungry for that learning. We want to take those learnings and pass them down and make better decisions. So when you think about the allies and the support structure that we put in place, I want to be from people providing educational support, you go down the list. It's important that we learn. And every day we need to get smarter, we need to get better. Because if we don't, this agenda is not going to move forward. It's not going to be sustainable. And what's important is it becomes sustainable. And we have this opportunity in front of us, and it's been in front of us for many years, but never more high, highlighted as it has been this year, given the racial unrest that we've seen. And, and David mentioned, you know, the Floyd events are extremely unacceptable and unfortunate, but it's also a wake up call that we got to move this agenda forward. We will never live in a great America if we don't solve this problem. I firmly believe that. Um, we cannot have the disparity we have. We cannot sit there and go into communities and see people struggling not being successful and turn the other way. That's not what leadership's about. And at the end of the day, you've got to step up and those allies help us do that. 
Um, when we did our community commitment, our $32 billion five-year community commitment, the first thing we did is we brought in, we have, we have five different advisory groups in five major cities that we serve to help us understand how best to put those resources to work, how best to make a difference in your community. Because we didn't know. We have, our, we have our thoughts. But if we don't engage them as part of the solution, right, then that's going to be a different challenge for us to solve for. Because they're going to see us doing things that maybe they don't agree with or they don't think it's the best way for us to spend our money. In addition to that, when we sit down with them, it's a collaboration. It's a discussion. They understand why we're going to take the, the steps we're going to take, why we're making the decisions we're going to make. And it creates a whole different outcome that we're looking for. So the allies are extremely important, provides that information, allows us to be better informed, and allows us to put a better support structure for advancing the agenda. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Greg, Greg if you wake up at any time in your life and you're a black man, call me first. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Please call me. We've got to have a conversation. <laughs> David, I want to make sure I give you an opportunity to answer that question as well, because I know uh, Proctor and I've got a ton of friends that, that, that work for PNG. There's a lot of work re revolved around allies and advocates as well. And I want, to, I want to toss that back to you as well. Well, I think it's powerful. In fact, one of the last speakers today at the very end is going to be Shelly McNamara. And she's one that's taught me a great deal about this, that the, the need to have allies be vocal, present, and, and be counted as opposed to passive supporters in the background. And, and it's interesting, there's many different organizations that I've seen both inside PNG and outside that have brought this to life. There's one of the courses in the gender equality space called MARC, which is men advocating for real change because in the gender equality work, it was very, very clear without men being active, so many of the women's groups did not have men. And they said, if we had men participate and listen, they would learn and work together. We've seen the same with, with our African-American leadership team. We've seen the same with our, our, our Gable group. It's just a powerful way to learn and contribute because then you're, you're again, you're on the field. This idea of this is not a spectator sport. This is one where we're working together to win a much bigger battle, which is the battle for equality the, the, across not only our company. And, and we said it starts at home, it starts with me first, it starts then with the leadership team and then more broadly in the company. But allies play a role because once you make the choice that you want to be part of the solution, then you need to engage. You need to learn. You need to be vulnerable. And one of the words that I really think is powerful is the willingness to be vulnerable. As leaders, if we have to maintain that we know what, you know everything and the facade of being in control, we will not get at these issues because we do not know. Many of the leaders, in fact, most, if I look around the business roundtable, you know, the hundred and some of the biggest companies, it does not reflect society. Uh, if I look at the consumer goods industry across the world, the 50 board members do not reflect society. So if we don't become engaged, be allies in a very real sense, then to me, this is going to take decades to move the needle. And I think we all believe the time is now. It's engage, start self, then your company, and then for many of ours, just as Greg is doing, which I applaud in Fifth Third, which is then extend the reach, the impact, because you have capability to do so. We, we're, we're fortunate to be in a community that has leaders and companies like Fifth Third and many others. One of the things, I've lived all around the world. There's not a place like Cincinnati in terms of the broad generosity of the community and the willingness to engage. And we have a very serious problem with poverty. We have a very serious problem on many social issues. And so you take those two things and say, the way you're gonna address them is you better come together. You've got some of these people that, that really, to me, are, are community minded, but they have to get in the game. They have to get in the game. And, and I think that's happening. Allies, and I would say very intentional, active allies. It is your time, it is your money, it is your resources, it is your decision space. And that's why I'm happy with things like the Take on Race, which is an initiative that we, we kicked off after a series of events. We've already had My Black is Beautiful has gone many, many years, and it's gotten stronger and stronger because we believed many, many years ago, My Black is Beautiful. We need to celebrate that beauty. And we've tried to do that, to me, across many different aspects of our business. But being an ally is powerful and important and almost a prerequisite if you're really going to start to move you know, in a meaningful way. Love that, love that. You, you, vulnerability is the key for me, right? Um, and I think, quite honestly, to piggyback off of that, as as those as the as the oppressed, 
we have to be vulnerable to receiving the allies and receiving mm -hmm. the advocates to get involved and be involved and teach them the ways to be involved. That's the way that we'll change change the world. David, I, I hate to pick on you, but I've got to touch on this because you, you said it earlier at the top end of your conversation. You talked about how the, the Procter & Gamble culture, and, I, and I, I'm sure it reflects uh, with, what, what Greg is doing with his organization as well, is looking to build in instead of adding on, right? And, and not embracing that a la carte style service of uh, equity and inclusion. Can you speak to that a little bit? And then Greg, I'm going to toss that question back to you as well. Yes, yes, and this is something I believe very deeply, which is when you have a separate effort that is on the side and you occasionally do reviews and there's a time of the year when you, you put that as a highlight, then to me, you'll, you'll make some progress, but it's very different if you put it to the core of what the company does. The core of what Procter & Gamble does is serve consumers through branded products and goods that we hope makes a difference in their life each and every day in a small but meaningful way. If the way you do that is by activating a diverse team of talent, then what you're gonna do, because it's core to your mission, is you're gonna invest heavily in that. If you really believe that a diverse team is gonna deliver better results, then it's built into how you win. I can give you another example on sustainability, environmental sustainability. If we design our innovation for our products with an eye toward being responsible consumers of the world's resources, the innovation will figure out formulas, packages, and designs. That's built in versus at the end of the day, how do we collect things that, that couldn't be recycled? And diversity, it is the most powerful. Think about it. If, you, if we had at PG all 100,000 people that could come authentically every day to work and, and bring their full self and not worry about trying to show up the way other people think they should, then think of the, the way we could serve consumers and the growth we could create. And to me, it, it, it is built in and it's one of the most powerful actions we can take as a company. It's why it should be. And it is a priority for me and the board of directors, because if I care about the company 10 years from now, we're a 183 year old company. I care about 10 years, 20 years from now, then it's all about the development of the talent and, and unleashing this amazing talent. And what I've seen is the more diverse our leadership team's gotten, the better the results get. The more we listen to people that challenge our thinking, the more we realize that's a better solution than what I came up with. And, and that to me, it's so powerful uh, that it has to be built in if you truly want outstanding, sustained results. Our society is changing in the world, but if our principles reflect it, we'll be well prepared to serve them. Absolutely, absolutely. Greg, you wanna take a stab at that in regards to the community effect versus the, or, or the horizontal versus the vertical? You know, I'm not sure I can add a lot to Dave. I think David really did a great job of, of, of summarizing the importance of diversity from a leadership perspective and having diverse input, diverse minds, diverse thinking about how we run our business. You know, we serve, we're the ninth largest U.S. consumer bank. A large part of our customer base is minorities, people of color, and so forth. Um, a lot of those are in areas that are struggling. So it's imperative, it's imperative as we think about the products that we provide. The way we serve those communities is to understand first those communities and their challenges. And that's where the diversity really, at the top of the house, really comes, really helps and supports our decisioning around what we're doing there. Getting into those communities, learning in those communities, and bringing out those learnings back to talk about what are the right products and servers? How do we help them be successful? How do we help them establish good credit scores? How do we help educate them okay, on the opportunities and importance of what a FICO score means, how to save, how to, how, to, how to support your 401k because of the match you get and so forth. Those are all important things, but knowing how to do that, right, starts with diversity. And I agree with David 100%. We will not have a great company if we don't have diverse thinking at the top of this house. And the data supports that. You go across the board, companies that are more diverse, the outcomes, the way they run their business, their growth, absolutely is outpacing the non-diverse companies out there. today. So it's, not, it's an imperative. You have to do it because it makes good sense for the business, it makes good sense for our society, and it makes great sense for our customers. That's the only thing I would add. Yeah, thank you both for your insights in that. I've got one last question, and this is, this is, my, this is my haymaker, so to speak, right? <laughs> and, uh, and this is a question that I've been, I've been pondering on for quite some time, and I, wa I want you both to respond to it. Um, and I'll let, you, I'll let you go in the order that you decide. During a time when it's absolutely unacceptable to sit silent and do nothing, what advice would you give to a business world leader, whether small or big, 
who had yielded on the side of waiting out until the smoke clears before speaking out to empower and do something. What advice would you give to that, that, that business leader who's just decided, I'm just gonna wait it out and see what happens? You know, Rick, I'll, I'll start with this one and throw it to, throw it to David. There's a, there's a saying in the military, if not me, then who? So if not you, then who? Who's gonna do the lifting, right? Who's gonna do the work? And as a CEO, as I mentioned before, you're in a very unique position, all right? To make, to make, to make decisions, put programs in place, to hold people accountable and advance the agenda. That is a very important responsibility that I know David and I both take very seriously, but we have the mic. So we can advance the agenda. So I would tell them, grab the mic, get input, seek input. And the great Martin Luther King, I love this quote from him. It's always the right time to do the right thing. Now is the right time. Extraordinarily well said. I, I, Greg, I couldn't agree more. The time is now, get started. This is the time where all of us can make a difference. Everybody on this, on this video, we've got almost 600 people. Just think about it, every one of us, instead of waiting to say we know what to go do, we just jump in. And what happens, and this is the vulnerability part, if, you, if you're trying to get it right because you wanna show well and show that you understand the issue, to me, you wait. And in today's world, not being part of the solution is part of the problem. And to me, then all of a sudden the standard goes up. So I'm not good if I'm not, racist. I'm not, you know, it's got to be, if you really want to be on the side of making a difference, then you have to be positively influencing because absent that we won't make the progress in our community and more broadly in society. So I think Greg said it well, it is the time is now. And the other thing is once you show a little vulnerability and open up, people help you. And then what happens is you're in it. And once you're in it, you learn, you grow, you contribute. And to me, it, it is a powerful way to move yourself personally forward and way to move your business forward. But you've gotta be willing to step in and I would do it now. My hope is sessions like this motivate people to take action today. And if that happens, this has been a fabulous session. Enrico, you've been a fabulous uh, moderator well, to help us. You ask the right questions, plus you understand at a personal level how powerful this is. And that's the same, you know, whether it's, I've worked with many of the leaders in Cincinnati, with Jill, I see, and many others that care so much that they jump in, they challenge, they ask. When someone asks them to do something, they say yes. They say yes. So I'd ask everybody, if there's an opportunity to get involved, say yes. And then you're going to make a difference. You'll learn and grow. And frankly, I think you'll look back and say it was one of the best decisions I made. Absolutely. Well said, Absolutely. And thank you for that. I mean, I was, I was raised by one of the biggest allies that I know. My grandmother moved to Cincinnati from Berlin in 1947. And, and she would always say, good enough is not good enough, right? Um, so I, I totally get it. David and Greg, thank you for the enlightening discussion. You've started this morning off perfectly by helping us reflect and plan our action steps moving forward, which I think is a huge component and reason why we're having this conversation today. I think this is gonna be a conversation that is remembered for years to come and it should. Uh, before we turn to our next session, I'd like uh, our participant to turn uh, your attention to the video from our friends at Cincinnati Bell. We've talked repeatedly about the importance of partners, supporters, and leaders, and this video is about just that. It's called Allies. Thanks, David and Greg. Thank you. have enough allies in our community who are looking at diver promote not looking at promoting diversity and inclusion again intentionally we have to challenge each other right um, we all get a little lazy now and then and we don't we don't speak out and speak up when we need to on issues where people are are not being inclusive or are intentionally discriminating um, so having allies, help support our voices and support our work. And I think that's really, really critical.
Allies are extremely important. And again, part of it's just a perception kind of thing. Um, I think some people who have a negative kind of look at this work in general, um, you know, they see it as like a them versus us, or that's for them, and I don't need to be part of it. Um, and allies are generally going to be people who don't necessarily fit into the categories, if we want to call them that, um, but they still support those, those people, right? There's a lot of work to do and be done. Um, and, you know, it's going to take more than just, for example, the African-American community um, to help in this because we don't make up most of the workforce, so just the way it is. So we have to bring people along. I was the first black female technical PhD that Procter & Gamble had ever hired. I did notice that there were some people, uh, both of my ethnicity and race and those not, who recognized the novelty of me and recognizing that the environment at that time was not as inclusive as what it is that we seek now, uh, there were some who really began to um, mentor me and later sponsor me. Best example is on the board of the University of Cincinnati and I eventually became chairman of that board. But on that board were, uh, was a woman who uh, uh, she was older than I was, but she thought the same way. I mean, very liberal, understand the patient, compassionate. So what we did, we said, okay, on the board, she would bring up the black issues, and I would bring up the female issues. Then that way, people couldn't pigeonhole her or me. If, as a black on that board, if I brought up all the black issues, people would say, oh, that's Odell. Of course, he's going to speak on the black issues. But if a white woman is speaking, or a white male, we had another person was a male, are speaking on black issues, then people have to listen and deal with it. They can't dismiss it. And then if I'm bringing up female issues, they can't say, oh, it's just a, another woman complaining or another woman saying something. So you have to have those type of collaborations to, to get things done. You look for people to share your values. Allies are necessary. And I think that when people are sitting in a room making strategic decisions as to who's going to run the next division or who's going to get promoted, there is value in having a voice in that room. They can say, well, you know what? I think this person would be really good. And these are the reasons why. We don't always, we're not always the person sitting at that table that are making those kinds of decisions. So it's important to have allies that look like us, that are African Americans that um, can speak on our behalf when they're in those rooms, and sometimes those that don't look like us. It's important to have somebody that speaks to your skill, to your integrity, and to your work ethic, and to your ability to align a team to get results. Good morning. Wow, that was a really powerful video and a really powerful first session. My name is Danielle Wilson, and I am the Vice President of Marketing at the Cincinnati Chamber. Before we bring up our next speakers, I want to tell you some important instructions for how we will do our breakout sessions later this morning. At approximately 1030, we will have the, you will have the option to participate in one out of four breakout groups. Our breakout room topics are, Breakout Room 1, Advocacy and Activism, Leading at Work and in the Community, hosted by Eric Kearney. Breakout Room 2, Supporting Black Women Leaders and Owners, hosted by Patrice Borders. Breakout Room 3, Black Executives in Our Region, How Our Region Can Support and Grow Black Talent, hosted by Marcus Thompson. Breakout Room 4, Valuing Black Talent Equals Valuing Black Culture, hosted by Jason Dunn. If you have the most recent version of Zoom installed, you will be able to choose your breakout group when we open up the rooms. If you do not have the most recent version, or if you are unsure, you may select your breakout room anytime during the event by editing your name. For example, if you would like to attend breakout room one, you would just change your username to one 
John Smith. To change your username, click on participants, hover your cursor on your name and select more. You will have the option to rename yourself to signify which breakout room you would like. If you do not have a preference, you will be randomly placed in a breakout room. We will repeat this once again before breaks. And if you can, and you can read about it in your um, email that you should have received earlier today. We will also be recording all breakout rooms so you will have access to all content after the event. Now to begin our next session, please welcome Scott Carroll with Jackson Lewis. Good morning, everyone, and welcome this morning. I'm so happy to be here as the, I'm the managing principal of the Southern Ohio offices of Jackson and Lewis. We're a thousand lawyer strong law firm all over the country, focusing exclusively on workplace law and particularly on how to help companies maximize the excellence of their workforce. We're very, very proud to be Mansfield 3.0 plus certified and the first law firm to have joined the CEO Action Diversity and Inclusion Roundtable that David spoke about earlier. Part of our world as workplace lawyers has enabled us to devote an entire practice group to diversity and inclusion practices and particularly helping companies raise the mirror inside their company so that they can take a strong look at themselves, figure out the data where they need to act, and then give leaders the data and the options so that they can dare to be different and act in the kind of manner that David and Greg spoke about so eloquently. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our next session and moderator, Paraz Parker is the Senior Director of Performance, Career, and Leadership Development at Kroger Company. She joined in 2016 as the Head of Talent Development for 8451, where she led executive and leadership development, onboarding, and talent strategy. Paraz serves on the Board of Directors at the Cincinnati Zoo and the YWCA. In partnership with the Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber, Paraz created Power Squad, which focuses on the leadership development and progression of women of color in the workplace. This next topic and next session is going to be just so important because it's individuals that actually decide to do different that matter so much. Paraz, welcome. Good morning and thank you, Scott, um, for the introduction. I'm so thrilled to be here today and support this round robin discussion from Cincinnati region leaders about why it's time for all of us to lead differently. Each of these individuals have led personally and within their organizations in new ways. Um, and each of them will offer perspectives on why it's critical for leaders in our region to change and do more. We all know, I think it's fair to say that this year has been a little different than what we may have imagined but it's also forced us, it's forced me to think differently about our teams, our needs, how inclusion must intentionally be kept at the center, even when life gets really tough. At Kroger, we take pride in feeding the human spirit. This year has been no different for us. I personally am proud of how we've continued to flex to serve our customers, our team members, and our communities. This year, we published our blueprint for business, it allowed us to share some of our learnings and best practices with others. I'm thankful um, you know, for the comments this morning around vulnerability. I was thinking about that um, too, as I thought about how I wanted to show up for today. Um, it, you know, influential storytellers like Brene Brown, who spoke about FFT, which I hope you'll look up what that means. Um, and because of conversations like the ones we're having today, the stories that Brene um, so vulnerably shares, um, it's made us as humans be more willing to be a bit more vulnerable. The vulnerability has helped many of us ask for help and has, has helped us to see our communities, um, especially in a time where we're faced with things like a global pandemic and social unrest. Kroger also shared publicly a, ga a guide to allyship the conversations from this morning were so encouraging to hear um, from our CEO leaders in our community, the criticality of that role, what it means to be an ally. 
And while it's easier, a little easier to be vulnerable, it's not always easy to ask for help. Um, and I think our guide to allyship is a great, it's been a great resource for me, a great resource for our teams to further understand, to learn how to get educated, where to go for resources. Um, and I think most critically learn how to listen. It supported us in getting more comfortable with having conversations we perhaps never had before. And just recently, we shared our diversity, equity, and inclusion framework that lays out five key areas of focus for us and our com continued commitment to diversity and inclusion and equity. While I could go on and on about how proud I am to be a program employee, I think I can do you five times better. I'm thrilled to play a small role in bringing you five wonderful individuals and Cincinnati leaders who have learned to lead differently in 2020 and who have framed their inclusion leadership in a uniquely Cincinnati way. They've each had different experiences leading their organizations and they each have some comments to share about why it's important and why it's time for the Cincinnati region um, regional businesses to lead differently. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our first panelist. Lee Fox, President and Chief Executive um, President, Cincinnati Bell. Lee is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Cincinnati Bell Incorporated. Mr. Fox has been with the Cincinnati Bell Company since July of 2001, most recently as President and Chief Operating Officer. In that role, he was responsible for overseeing all aspects of operations, sales, and customer care for both entertainment and communication segments and the IT services and hardware segment. Mr. Fox has also served as the company's chief financial officer from 2013 until September 2016, responsible for all aspects of finance, accounting, and treasury. A native of Cincinnati, Mr. Fox holds a bachelor's degree from Miami University and an MBA from the University of Cincinnati. He is the incoming board chair of the U.S. Regional Chamber. Thanks, Paras. Uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, it's such an a important topic and, and such an important uh, symposium. Uh, there's really not much I can add to uh, what, what Greg and David said, um, you know, I'm, Whoever put me uh, put me up following those two, I, I, you know, I don't know what I did wrong, but uh, you know, they're such great speakers and they covered such a wide range of topics. Um, and I can only tell you what leading differently means for us at Cincinnati Bell. And you know, what we really focus on is, and, and it's been said, right, uh, is is that you know, intentional, tough conversations and transparency. And um, the video is a great example of that. One of the um, things that we've done is try to empower employees through our employee resource groups. Uh, our bold uh, resource group, uh, which is our African American leadership group, uh, they were really responsible for that video and a series of videos. And um, they came to me and said, "Hey, we'd like to do some videos that are uh, pretty, you know, uh, tough topics, and and you know, we want to we want to bring it out in the open." And you know, my job was just you know, uh, candidly, just say, "Of course." Right, you know, th this is an important um, dialogue. We need to have it, and we need to have the tough conversations from the people experiencing it. And so, they did a phenomenal job in a series of videos, which th that is one of them. Uh, but we also just we really believe in in driving intentionality uh, with the company, and we really do that two ways. We drive it externally and internally, uh, and a lot of things you've heard you know, we as a smaller company also are doing. So one of the things I would encourage is leaders in Cincinnati, uh, not just the big global leaders that, you know, look, two great leaders you heard from, you know, right before me run phenomenal organizations and they're very large organizations. We're honestly lucky to have them in our community. But when you start to creep down to smaller companies like mine and others, all of us need to lead the same way. And what we do uh, with intentionality, and, and I think Greg said it really, really well, you know, what are you driving, you know, from the standpoint of outcomes, right? Well, we look at investing in business community. We're a part of the MBA at Business Accelerator, that investment. Uh, we've worked with uh, the NCAA, uh, with the John McClendon um, Leadership Institute that they're starting up, which is effectively an institute to, um, you know, develop and groom diverse leadership uh, through colleges. Um, we've invested in, uh, free broadband. And for, for, for me, 
that's an important one. This is what we do. We're, we're the plumbers of Cincinnati, right? And, and uh, the other communities that we live in. And addressing the digital inequities is such an important aspect of what we're seeing uh, today. Uh, the, you know, the digital inequity is going to drive a further gap in inequity down, down, you know, in the future and down the line. And we need to address these, these issues today. And as the provider of broadband, uh, we look at it as, you know, this is, it's our responsibility in our communities to drive that. So we're spending millions of dollars uh, to try to get free broadband to communities that don't have it. Um, internally, we need to do a better job also. Um, you know, candidly, I, I look at our organization and if you look at the traditional DNI metrics, uh, you would you would say we're fine, right? But when you start to peel back that onion, you know, and, and those layers, we're not fine. And um, you know, as, as I look at leadership, right, we're not fine from a diversity standpoint. And we are massive believers that the diversity needs to happen at levels that make decisions, and in every company, right. And so our goal over the next few years, we, we just hired a, um, a head of DNI. I'm a big believer that if you know you want to make change, somebody's got to wake up every day and be responsible for that change. And our goal over the next few years is to get leadership decision making diversity. And to me, that's that's the key, right? You have to have diversity in decision making. These people, I, I have to, you know, I have to have a funnel of diverse next CEOs, which sadly I don't have. I look at the funnel in our organization and um, I don't have a diverse uh, candidate pool of folks that are gonna take my job. And that's my goal. And that should be all of our goals, right? I should have a, a very diverse pool of people that are gonna take my job. And, and to me, that drives change. And, and as an organization, that's what we believe in in driving uh, change for the future. So, you know, being direct and intentional uh, I think has to be the goal of every company, regardless of the size. And um, it, it has to be an investment, not just inside their company, uh, which I, and I believe all of us do, right? All of us care about this subject for all the reasons that Greg and David talked about, but it also has to be externally. We have to be intentional about, you know, investing in our communities and being intentional about that. That investment is key also. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Liev, um, for your comments. And I hope that you all are uh, following along in the chat as well. There's been some great discussion there. And I would be remiss if I didn't shout out um, Candice for posting the link to the Brene Brown podcast that I was talking about. Um, and it sounds like Matt out there is, is really learning and listening and answering the call of, if not who, then you. Thanks, Matt. My name is hard, I know. Um, so I appreciate you putting the pronunciation paris in the uh, in the chat. I've not seen it that way before, and it's a great it's a great way to it's a great way to write it. So thanks so much. Um, next, we have Dr. Angelica Hardy, Vice President, Health Strategies, American Heart Association. Dr. Hardy currently serves as Vice President of Health Strategy at the American Heart Association, where she's dedicated to our region, the Greater Cincinnati and Northern uh, Northern. Kentucky Community Health Initiatives. In this role, she provides leadership focused addressing top health priorities for our region. Her goal is making our community the most equitable and healthy region in the United States. She's also an advocate for higher education and teaches both undergrad and graduate courses at the University of Cincinnati. Dr. Hardy is a native of Cleveland, Ohio, and three-time alumna of the University of Cincinnati, where she, where she received her bachelor's, master's, and doctorate focused in public health, health policy, and global health systems. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it has been an awesome morning and really inspiring. I've been taking a lot of notes. Um, and I'm like, well, what am I going to talk about after hearing all of the inspiring leaders in our region discuss how to lead differently? And I wear multiple hats, as we mentioned, University of Cincinnati hat, my awesome American Heart Association role. Um, but one we didn't mention was my role as president of Urban League Young Professionals of Greater Southwestern Ohio. And I think all of those um, really helped me really decide how to lead differently and how in all of those roles and all of those hats that I wear, where 
can I assist <laughs> in leading differently? And how can I inspire many of the leaders in those organizations to do the same? Um, so when it comes to the American heart and really focusing on heart health or health as overall in our region, um, we mentioned earlier other things like social determinants of health and our health inequities that really impact us greatly. So we've talked a lot about businesses and income and we know the importance of that and then how transportation, how housing, how food access really all are a part of that. So it's not even just in our roles as um, leaders in these businesses, but also how are we leading in our community? How are we making sure that we're advocating for change in our neighborhoods? And how are those, how are we utilizing the skills that we may learn at work uh, to be change agents in our, in our region as a whole? So serving on councils, uh, speaking up at meetings and how we serve in those roles. In addition to that, I think about Urban League Young Professionals and other awesome young professional groups in our region that are often the first touch point for a lot of our transplants like myself. Uh, when you come to Cincinnati, how are you getting connected? Um, you're here and we, how do we keep you here? How do we make sure we retain that talent? How do we make sure that you feel at home and how do we make sure that you decide to stay? Um, you buy a home, you put down some roots and you make Cincinnati the place you wanna be. And I think that's where I really wanna talk about how leading differently. Um, the things that I thought about after the conversation today is the creating space, um, having you feel at home and, and safe and not only your place of, place of employment, but feel at home in that neighborhood that you decide to call home. And within that, I think it's bringing your full authentic self um, to work. And I think that's one of my really charges and challenges for leading differently. Um, I think many of us have heard the term code switching. It's something that I really try not to do. I want to be the same person at eight o'clock in the morning when I'm at work, um, the same person there as the same person I am speaking up at a council meeting or speaking up for my community in the evening. And I think that's really the charge I want to leave today is how do you create space? And I still sometimes toy with the word inclusion because sometimes even myself, I'm like, well, if it's inclusion, are we still leaving is it the place of that we are leaving individuals out and bringing them in? But are we really creating new space that we co-create together? Um, so I still toy with that word myself, um, but I think all of the things of in inclusion, both in being intentional and how are we creating space for individuals to bring their authentic selves from work? And I think of things that we've seen nationally as um, different hairstyles, but also how are you able to advocate for your community and priorities that you are passionate about? And how are those accepted and empowered and really envisioned to be a new part of your business? So I think those are the really strong uh, points that I really want to make. How are you creating space for all of your employees to be their, their authentic selves all the time, for their voice to be heard, and them to be empowered to lead to uh, retain and keep them in this community and continue to strive for change. So those are how I really hope that you can lead differently. Thank you so much, Dr. Hardy, and um, really phenomenal comments around you know, authentic self and sharing some of your personal stories um, and helping people learn about, you know, what code switching and, and what that means and how we create the space that you just spoke of. Um, next, we have Kickley, Executive Director of the Cincinnati Music Accelerator. The Cincinnati Music Accelerator is an organization that is dedicated and focused on the development of music creatives, fostering and fueling placemaking, and striving for economic development and impact within the community it serves through the musical arts. Kick has already worked in music for over 16 years and, had, and has had his musical works licensed in place in advertisements with brands such as Disney, a favorite of mine, mm -hmm. Toyota, and Samsung. In addition to being the executive director of the Cincinnati Music Accelerator, he operates KL Studios Incorporated, which specializes in audio recording, audio production, post-production, and music licensing for TV, film, trailers, and commercials. Hi, Pars, and good morning to everyone. Um, you know, being who I am, I've been put in a unique position. You know, I am a Black man. Uh, I am a foster kid. You know, I've been through several different things throughout my life that have given me 
interesting experiences. Um, I've met so many wonderful people over time, but as I got older and just was searching through my creative craft and trying to figure out life, you know, the big thing was how do I remain here in Cincinnati doing what I do and that's music. You know, a lot of people know there's not a large music industry and a lot of people leave, but I didn't want to be one of those individuals that just say, you know what, I can't make it here. You know, I, I need to go to LA, Chicago, Nashville, whatever. I couldn't do that. I stayed because, you know, I believe in a lot of the people that are here and I wanted to figure out how do I become a leader, you know, but the very thing to way not, you know, you say you want to be a leader, but you shouldn't try to lead. Just do what you do that's best. Um, I found creative ways through the art of music to just lead and talk to different people, you know, communicate, build relationships, but not just with, you know, the people in leadership, but also the people with music, the people in the arts. The arts are what drive us day to day. It is the power, power, the uh, power of the arts is what brings us together. It keeps us strong. And, you know, I tried to just think of different ways of just doing what I do. And we found other ways to be creative and that's creative placemaking. You know, we, thanks to Arts Wave and the Hale Foundation, we were able to get a mobile stage trailer to go to underserved communities and activate and to spread our voice, but not just our voice, the uh, community and leaders of themselves. You know, we can go pretty much anywhere and activate in spaces and places. Um, other ways we go out is, like I said, we try to encourage the musicians to go out and speak on their own stories, tell their stories, tell people in the community why it's important for you to be supported, why it's important for you to be funded, why it's important for the world to just be happy. You know, um, there's so many wonderful people that I've seen through this call. You know, Rico moderated something very amazing, and he's also a wonderful leader himself. He just does what he does best. And that's just be him, you know, be your authentic self, bring yourself 100% to everything you do. Don't try to sugarcoat who you are. You'd be surprised how many people are just sitting there, you know, wondering, just say, I want to be just like this person. Just be you, you know, you never know who, you know, they may end up resonating with you in other ways. Um, other ways you can just be who you are is just, like I say, Share your music, share your story, tell who you are, um, you know, impact different people. Don't be afraid to go out, help. Don't be afraid to go out, speak your voice on social media. You know, you may get backlash, so what? Not everybody's going to agree with you. It is you and who you are that makes you a leader. That is a way to lead, that is a way to be diverse because there are a lot of people that just don't want to lead. So the more we have more diverse leadership in what we do, the more we we can succeed as a community ecosystem. Thanks so much, Kick, and thanks for um, you know being you for hundred percent of the time. Look forward to seeing you in uh, real life here, hopefully sooner rather than later. Next, um, it's my pleasure to welcome Moira Weir from the United Way of Greater Cincinnati. Moira became president, CEO of United Way of Greater Cincinnati in March of 2020. Prior to that, she served as director of Hamilton County Job and Family Services. Throughout her 27 year career, she created numerous award-winning programs designed to engage, embrace, and educate families and children. She was also a 2016 YWCA Career Woman of Achievement and a member of Leadership Cincinnati Class 27. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And, you know, really, um, like Lee said, it's hard to follow all of these wonderful speakers because they really have said so many wonderful um, things for us to learn. But really, this is such an opportunity for us really to come together and really think about as a community, how can we really address these issues? And I, I've been fortunate to work in the human services uh, field for m most of my career in our community. And one thing I know is that when business leaders put their mind to something, change can really happen. And so it's wonderful that we're having this conversation today because I know the business community can really change our region in a way that's gonna impact lives uh, of those that are living here. And I think as a community, we're in such a critical time. We have to both individually and collectively think about and understand really fully the barriers that continue to impact so many of our- Kayla, can you hear me? And neighbors. 
um, throughout our region and how can we make sure everybody has an equity, has equity in terms of their quality of life. And when I think about how we can do this regionally, um, one thing that I try to do when I think about things is I have humility and I, I love also vulnerability. Brene Brown's a huge fan of mine, but really how do we have uh, openness and humility to accept that we all have biases and how do those biases impact us day to day and really challenge ourselves. And I always say we have to be open both with our mind and heart because we have to listen with both to really understand and, and really challenge ourselves not to judge. Um, and I also think it's important when you lead organizations to recognize we all come to it with different lived experiences and how do those experiences impact how I react, respond, engage, or choose not to engage. And that's very common when we're in the social service industry in terms of how do we engage people or why aren't they engaging? So I think we have to honor and respect those differences. Um, this year has been an awakening for all of us. And it's, it's been a tipping point. Um, I think the momentum is shifting and awareness. People are eager to have conversations about equity, which is critical. Um, equity is the core of conversations in so many sectors across the region. And in order to truly lead differently, I think we have to really examine what equity looks like, um, first with ourselves, within our offices, both inside and outside of the walls of, of our organizations and challenge all of us to really think about that. And we can't just look at equity and inclusion and diversity as a buzzword, but really it's gotta be baked into everything we do. And I would say that you have to be, and we've tried to be at United Way very intentional always about how we're weaving this into everything that we do in our business practices. And so, um, you know, one, some of the things that we try to do at the United Way is we really wanted to prioritize equity inclusion from the very beginning. And, and like all of you, um, these pandemics gave us that opportunity to really think about it. So, you know, first of all, we wanted to make sure we had, when we talk at the United Way about um, equity, you can't think about that. And when we're talking about poverty, those are the core values in terms of how we help families through financial stability, um, quality, education, access to healthcare. So we really wanted to first make sure our, our leadership team was reflective of those that we're serving. And we were very intentional about making sure we had people of color and women in our leadership team. And I'm proud to say, I think our leadership team really represents our community. Um, we also wanted to put a huge emphasis on community engagement. We wanted to engage the community in a different way than has ever been done before. We wanted to make sure we brought lots of voices to the table and that we were listening to those that often felt like they didn't have a voice at the United Way. And we're being very intentional in terms of how we, how we engage the community in that way. Um, we also, through our rapid response fund, wanted to make sure that we had a lens of equity with everything that we were doing. And we made sure we reached out to some of the folks that typically don't get funding. And we were very intentional about touching all aspects and all organizations throughout the community to make sure we could really help people in terms of how they remove those barriers and, and help them lift them out of poverty and address their needs. We also were very intentional with our Black Empowerment Works funding, something that I'm so proud of the team that, that did both internally and externally. We were very intentional about funding Black-led organizations, and we we're going to continue to have that laser-focused vision um, until it becomes natural. We don't even have to have those distinctions, but we're going to be very intentional about that. And then we really wanted to, you know, challenge ourselves internally in terms of how we look. So, you know, we made diversity, equity, inclusion, an ownership we all own internally, and we're looking at our policies, our practices. We've engaged a third party to come in and help us challenge it and have those tough discussions in a safe way, but again, with humility and, and really striving hard to have honest, open conversations. Um, and I think we're, and we're also working with our partner agencies to really struggle, you know, challenge us all to think about how we look in our boards and our, and our, and our leadership and as well as our, our staffing. So, you know, I think about what we can do as a community collectively and, and the vision forward, you know, I want to think, let's invest in our communities, let's invest in those families and individuals that need us. Um, you know, think about how we can invest in education, job training. You know, maybe we can think about where we want to put a grocery store where there's a, a food desert. We want to maybe how we can make banking easier, you know, for families that are disadvantaged. Um, make sure you're always hiring with DEI in your mind. And then if you're having a hard time finding talent, develop the talent. Give people the opportunity within your organization. Give them educational training so that they can then become your future leaders. Um, and I would say, you know, I, from my perspective, working in human services, you know, investing in education and job training is critical for, for people to be able to, to break those barriers and to move forward. And, um, and if, if you are having difficulty, reach out to partners that, are, that have been successful and be open to seeing what they've done to learn. And I would just close by saying, you know, if not now, when? This is an opportunity that we can really impact our community. And I am eager to work with all of you to really to help do that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maura, and thanks also for bringing, you know, concepts of humility, openness, 
Um, and again, the vulnerability for asking for help when um, you don't know quite the best yet way to do it. Next, um, I'd like to welcome Diane Altmix from Accenture. Um, Diane has been uh, with Accenture for 25 years. Um, she serves as the Managing Director of Technology Inclusion and Diversity. Diane works closely with the North America Technology Leadership Team to achieve Accenture's ambitious inclusion and diversity objectives. She's a graduate of Class 40 of Leadership Cincinnati. She's a member of NEW, a board member of the University of Cincinnati Economic Center, and a member of the Development Committee of the Women's Fund of the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, so, you know, as we talk about uh, inclusion and diversity, and specifically what we're doing in our region, uh, you know, I feel honored to talk with all these other leaders locally. And you're going to hear a lot of the same themes from me that you heard from many of our other leaders. So at Accenture, we have been and continue to strive to be a leading voice um, in workplace equality. Our ambition, it's bold, and it's to be the most inclusive and diverse company in the world. And we're accelerating a culture of equality to ensure our people feel like they can belong and advance and thrive. So as you know, you know, we talked about this morning in dude's remarks, right? When people can bring their whole self to work, we are better. And economically, we're better. Our research, and you'll hear me talk about our research often, our research on diversity shows that a culture of equality the same kind of workplace environment that helps everyone advance and thrive is a powerful multiplier of innovation and growth. And it also showed us that the most equal and diverse cultures employ their employee innovation mindset is 11 times greater than the least equal and diverse cultures. So powerful statement that says when we all can contribute, we all can advance. Interestingly, though, as we talk about the fact we've not done enough in the inclusion and diversity space, our recent 2020 research found that there is a large perception gap between the way leaders and employees view progress towards equality in their organizations. And if the leader employee gap were narrowed, we estimated that the global profits would be higher by 33%. And that was an equivalent of $3.7 trillion in 2019, which is a large, you know, which is a lot of money that we as leaders are leaving on the table if we don't address this um, cultural inequality gap. So in 2018, um, Accenture had a program that they established, which was called Building Bridges, an open dialogue on diversity, because we believed it was important that you could come and provide your voice at the workplace in a safe way and have open and honest dialogue and discussion around the issues of race and religion. In June this past year, our Black and African American ERG held a Building Bridges session due to the death of George Floyd and anti-racism protests around the world. That really, as we all talked about this morning, it was really a tipping point for all of us. And this was a raw and heartfelt discussion. And it made it very clear to our leaders that our employees were hurting. And we continue that dialogue today in our local Cincinnati team and through what we call our Courageous Conversation series, and that's led by Vince Bird, our local Black and African-American ERG lead. So while, we were, so while we are proud of our longstanding commitment to accelerating equality, our 2020 research, the discussions with our employees, but most importantly, our hearts told us we were not doing enough and we had more to do. So as a result, our CEO, Julie Sweet, who is an advocate of diversity and you know, one of the uh, recently, right, Fortune's num you know, number one um, CEO, we, she publicly pledged that by 2025, the company would increase the representation of African-American and Black people in our organization from 9 to 12%, and increase the number of African-American and Black managing directors, which are the utmost leaders in our organization from 2.8% to 4.4%. So while those numbers seem small in an organization of 500,000 people globally, we knew that just moving the dial a bit would make an impactful difference. Because unlike Lee's comments earlier, our data told us we were not at the place we wanted to be. You know, the numbers didn't show that we had made the progress we needed to. And, um, 
and each of our managing directors locally here in the Cincinnati office and globally are held accountable to meeting those numbers. We have performance metrics tied to meeting our goals as it relates to gender and ethnic diversity. And we think that's an important part of holding people accountable. We've also developed the Accenture Student Empowerment Program because we know that impacting the diversity of the workforce in the future is, be, is starts by impacting the diversity of the students that we hire. So it's an early identification program to enhance professional development and leadership skills. And we are specifically looking at our hiring in Cincinnati and have pivoted some of the things that we were doing to make sure that we are identifying early um, in both relationships with the University in Cincinnati and other universities to increase the talent pool of Black um, and African-American candidates. But the one thing I'm most excited about is we've recently launched the Black Founders Development Program. So Moira was talking about investing. We sat down and said, we know that we need to put our money where our heart lies. And that what we bring to the table as Accenture is leadership, resources, technology, and investment expertise. And we can provide those in areas where Accenture can deliver significant support to Black entrepreneurs. So our Black Founders Development Program is a program to help accelerate innovation and further grow businesses. Because once again, data tells us and told us that um, in a study by Rate My Investor in VC Diversity, that Black founders of companies receive less than 1% of all venture capital funding, which in the US alone totaled approximately $130 billion. Similarly, a US Census Bureau, the Census Bureau data found that 28% of Black entrepreneurs' profits were limited by lack of access to capital, compared to just 10% of white entrepreneurs. So to address those inequalities in venture capital across the Black community, we know that change requires research, uh, conversation, understanding, and action through joint partnership. So we are seeking to deliver a differentiated program in this space. So we're investing in and supporting Black technology startup founders and entrepreneurs led by what we have, uh, our Accenture Ventures program. So we're seeking to help Black business owners and leaders advance and grow their technology businesses through greater, more direct access to venture capital, corporate mentorship, strategic connections and, um, with our Accenture managing directors, but also with all the business partners and clients we have in our ecosystem. So as part of the new program, the fund will make strategic investments in early stage Black founded and run software startups and other marketing development initiatives. And we will personally put people in those programs working with the, um, to provide that technology innovation and investment expertise. And that powerful network of technology ecosystem providers, including Microsoft, Amazon, um, and Google. So, we're looking to help Black entrepreneurs achieve their goals and make a meaningful impact. And that is the investment that we want to make in our communities here in Cincinnati and throughout the United States. Um, so in the end, you know, with our people's support and unwavering commitment, we want to make a difference and we want to uh, close the gap. So we're acting, we're doing what we can, and we're leading and we're convinced that we're going to drive change. That's great. Thanks so much, Diane. And thanks for bringing um, data into the discussion. I think you're spot on. Once we know our numbers, we know how we can be even more intentional in um, the change that we want to drive or things, behaviors we want to sustain. So thanks again. And thanks to all of our panelists. Um, I hope you feel inspired, engaged, and ready to act. Um, as I was listening to each story and these diverse perspectives, um, and it certainly didn't hurt that Greg earlier and um, Moira helped me uh, see this in my brain, but I couldn't help but um, vision an image from the Freedom Center that literally reflects the words, if not you, then who, if not now, then when. So thanks again um, for sharing your stories, um, sharing your experiences and sharing your ideas uh, with everybody on the line today. Now, if you'll please join me in welcoming Anthony James, Interim Vice President for Institutional Diversity and Inclusion from my alma mater, Miami University.
Good morning and welcome. My name is Anthony James and I am the Interim Vice President for Institutional Diversity and Inclusion at Miami University. Miami University is proud to sponsor the 2020 Fifth Third Bank Diversity Leadership Symposium because these partnerships are essential to mutually beneficial interests. Miami possesses a broad range of talent and a research infrastructure that assists corporate partners with meeting corporate needs through activities such as basic and applied research and development, technology development and commercialization, entrepreneurship, business and marketing consultation, policy and management development and consultation, and so on. Corporate partnerships allow Miami University to enhance the lived experience of our faculty, staff, and students through activities such as collaborative programming, internship and practicum opportunities, corporate grants, cutting edge training, and so on. However, today's symposium goes beyond these typical reasons for engaging in our local community through partnerships. Today's programming helps us, Miami University, not only reflect on our own mission and efforts to advance inclusive excellence, but also allows us to listen and dialogue with others who share our commitment to promote and actualize diversity, equity, and inclusion of individuals in our regional communities, especially those that have historically been marginalized by systemic barriers. So whether that means meeting the needs of diverse consumers or realizing equity of opportunities and producing inclusive environments within our organization, Miami University is excited and proud to be part of and to support this critically important effort. And we thank you for your intentional efforts in this arena. I'm excited to introduce to you Kala Gibson. Last week, Kala was promoted to the role of Chief Enterprise Corporate Responsibility Officer and Head of Business Banking. With over 30 years in the financial services industry, Gibson has extensive experience in strategic planning, operations, regulatory compliance, product development, and relationship management. He also has been a powerful voice in matters of community responsibility and accountability, as well as social justice and a broad social equity. He joined Fifth Third in 2011 as a business banking executive in Eastern Michigan and was named head of business banking in 2013. Welcome, Kala. Hey, thank you, Anthony, and good morning to everyone. I'm really excited to moderate our next session. I'm really excited about the topic. Uh, you know, I was a uh, add-on at the last minute, and I remember when Mitch Morgan at Fifth Third called me and said, hey, we really need you to step in and moderate. Initially, I said, no, I don't know if I really have the time, but then I saw uh, the powerhouse uh, uh, panelists that we have today, and I said, you know what, there's no way um, that I can miss this opportunity. I love attending this event. Usually I'm sitting back taking notes, but again, this is my, my first year actually being a part of uh, this session, so I'm really excited. Anthony mentioned something that's also exciting, which is my new role, and was really excited this week to launch our $2.8 billion uh, commitment. You heard Stephanie Smith and Greg Carmichael talk about that earlier, but one of the reasons I'm excited about that is that there's a huge component that's committed to business, um, particularly with our neighborhood strategy where we're gonna make investments, not just in affordable housing in key neighborhoods around our footprint, but most importantly, we're gonna invest in small, medium-sized businesses to make sure that we're driving the route outcomes as it relates to our community. So today's panelists are gonna talk about how businesses can affect diversity and what they're doing in their respective spaces to drive better outcomes. So let me start First, with our first group of panelists, I'm going to first welcome uh, Dan Reedus, who's the Executive Director of the Minority Business Accelerator, and Patrick Glassley, the Managing Partner and Founder of Constellation Wealth Advisors. They're going to talk about the work of the Minority Business Accelerator and exciting new work that's coming in 2021. But let me just say a couple of things about Darren first. So he serves as Vice President and Executive Director for the Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber in charge of his flagship Minority Business Accelerator Program and Regional Economic Inclusion Efforts, a national thought leader for inclusive entrepreneurship and growing larger scale diverse businesses. Darren is a seasoned business executive and successful entrepreneur. Prior to Cincinnati, joining the Cincinnati Chamber, Darren served as president, CEO for Main Street Inclusion Advisors, a national consulting firm developing diverse technology-based businesses and networks. 
And then our next speaker, along with uh, Darren, is going to be Patrick Lafley. Patrick is the managing partner and founder of Quadrant Capital Group, a diversified wealth management firm. Through the Constellation Wealth Advisors brand, the firm currently manages over $1.6 billion in assets for high net worth families in the Cincinnati marketplace. Prior to forming the company, Patrick held a variety of positions in the financial services, telecommunications, and media industries with leading firms and has worked and lived in New York City, Shanghai, San Francisco, Sydney, and of course, Cincinnati. Patrick currently serves on the Board of Trustees for the Christ Hospital, the Cincinnati Regional Chamber, and the Catholic Inner City Schools Education Foundation. Please welcome Darren and Patrick. Thanks so much, Kala. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, Darren, are you there? I can't see you yet. I am here and ready to go, sir. There you are. Good to see you virtually today. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> hey, what do you say we mix this up a little bit and do a little bit more of a fireside chat for the for the audience? Let's do it. Let's do it. So, um, Hey, Darren, I think, you know, many of the folks on the listening in and the symposium today are probably aware of the work of the accelerator somewhat, but there are probably also a lot of folks who are not uh, privy to all the good work that the accelerator has done over the last 17 years. So if you could start by introducing um, the accelerator and not just kind of what you all do, but I think it's appropriate given the year that we've had here in 2020, there's a parallel with the origins of the accelerator that I think is meaningful to share with everybody who haven't, who hasn't, doesn't know the history. So Absolutely. if you could speak to the origins of the accelerator, how it was founded, and then talk about your core work today. Awesome. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you so much also just for, for leaning in in such a big way as you have, which we'll talk, of course, more about in our time together here this morning. You have just really been an exceptional partner. Um, with respect to the Minority Business Accelerator, as Patrick mentioned, many are aware, but, but many may not be. So I'm going to provide, provide a little bit of context with respect to what has now been a 17-year journey. For those that may not be aware, um, the accelerator itself was actually birthed out of, of Cincinnati's own civil unrest back in 2001. And one of the uh, byproducts of that was to try to grow larger scale African-American businesses. And so it was then and now rooted in a supply chain strategy. So it was very much led by our corporate business leaders and it was not accidental that this was housed in the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce. And so within the regional chamber, you have your, of course, uh, business leaders and that ongoing monthly access to that board, the, the commitment of the chamber to see this successful um, is, is a huge part of the reason that 17 years later, uh, we're still here and going strong. The work that I, took over, uh, just blessed and honored to do so almost five years ago now, inherited a, a phenomenal foundation that basically uh, since inception, we've, we've supported a little over 70 companies at this point that in the aggregate, you know, do over a billion dollars in aggregate revenues and created over 3,500 jobs. We have set very ambitious goals from a context setting standpoint here to grow by an incremental billion and create an incremental 3,500 jobs through what we call a four pillar approach that I'll go through very, very quickly. This four pillar approach is what we call grow, build, attract, and create. So in the grow pillar, we are essentially saying, let's grow our current companies of size to their next level. So if they're already doing say 20 million in revenue, how do we grow them from 20 to 40 or 50? If they're at 10, how to get from 10 to 20, et cetera. And so there's a bunch of tactics up under there, but fundamentally the grow pillar is growing our current company to their next level. The build pillar is a uh, intentional pipeline building effort to create the next wave of, of million dollar plus uh, minority firms. This is work that we do in collaboration 
with a phenomenal group of nonprofits in the region that we call the Cincinnati Minority Business Collaborative or the CNBC. Uh, this is an effort in part that's trying to identify at least 10 emerging minority firms a year or 50 over the next five years. And in fact, in the Cincinnati Inquirer over the past several months, we've been highlighting 12 of those. So if the folks have not seen that, great time to see what's in, in the pipeline. The attract pillar very quickly is working with our partner Ready Cincinnati, trying to attract larger scale minority firms here in gaps of where we don't have them. These are all firms north of 20 million in size. And then finally, which is also getting a tremendous amount of, of, of momentum is the create pillar, which is creating uh, new minority firms through the acquisition of mainstream or, or non-minority firms, if you will, with no succession plan, no kids in the company interested in taking it over. How can we identify credible minority buyers to acquire mainstream firms and not have to grow everything organically? Depending on the report that one reads, there are literally trillions of dollars in play nationally of existing small to mid cap companies without succession plans. And so as a framing piece, uh, Patrick, a little bit of sort of the, the background and, and some go, go forward context. That's great, thanks, Darren. Darren, I, I think it would be helpful if you spent some more time on that last pillar because that is something that's innovative um, that the accelerator is doing. And if you could give exam maybe one or two examples um, of how the accelerator is looking to support that initi that pillar initiative um, in its go forward future plan. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so it's, um, and we'll talk more about some 2021 work coming up here momentarily, but we are partnering specifically with our, our banking partners, accounting firms, law firms, et cetera, uh, organizations that are touching these very small to mid cap companies that I'm speaking of, they have them as clients. And so, as I mentioned, um, there's, as, and there's much data at this point that um, is really speaking to this, but if, if I just think about companies, be, existing companies between 2 million and say $50 million in annual revenue. And uh, in most cases, data says that 75% of such companies do not have a succession plan. And so there is this moment in time, we talk a lot about in these broad based discussions, closing the wealth gap uh, and things of that nature. And so here is a phenomenal opportunity to in part play a role in closing that wealth gap through entrepreneurship through acquisition. And so when I think about, let's just pick on a, an industry real quickly, such as manufacturing. Manufacturing, if you think about the heavy equipment, um, asset heavy sort of industry, overlaid against historical lack of access to capital for people of color, it's no surprise you don't see a lot of minority owned manufacturing firms in today's landscape. But in that very same landscape, you have aging business owners, their children have gone to do something entirely different, did not want to run that manufacturing plant. And those are phenomenal opportunities to acquire in to industries that people of color have been historically left out of. And quite frankly, those are easier industries to finance because of the heavy assets that can be uh, part of a collateral package and things of that nature. And so, so we are super excited about this acquisition piece and a few transactions changes the game overnight. Yeah, great. That's helpful, Darren. You know, before we talk about how you're going to attack that further at the accelerator, maybe it would be helpful if you could share, you know, how's the, how's the Cincinnati region doing relative to peer cities with respect to this effort? Absolutely. It, it's such a, a great point, uh, Patrick. There's, there is um, a lot of data and uh, increasingly around growing quote unquote, larger scale minority firms. And, and more than ever, scale matters. When I say scale, when we talk about creating more diversity in the corporate supply chains, well, you have to, of course, have some infrastructure and some capacity and some scale to be viable vendors in, in corporate supply chains. 
And so what many people may not realize because in part of this 17 year effort, uh, the Cincinnati region ranks amongst the top in the nation in growing larger scale uh, minority firms. Absolutely, we have more work to do. But last year, there was a interesting report that was put out by LendingTree.com that ranked the top 50 United States uh, metropolitan areas across the country. Entrepreneurs were finding success. And, and surprisingly, perhaps to many, the Cincinnati region came in number 10 on that list just behind Atlanta. Importantly, however, in certain categories, we actually rank number one in the nation. And this is a very important statistic. So one of the categories looked at the percentage of minority firms with annual revenues greater than 500,000, right? And so we have the highest percentage of minority firms greater than 500,000 in the country. Absolutely, other cities have more minority businesses than we have, but of those that we have, we have the greatest percentage of scale. And, and that reality, on top of the fact that our model was birthed out of our own civil unrest many years ago, has now put Cincinnati front and center in the national spotlight as, as the nation begins to grapple with how they, city to city to city across this country, can start growing more scalable um, minority firms. And so we find ourselves in a unique place to fully leverage in a variety of ways with national foundation partners and other sorts of resources in that way to further build out our national sort of lead positioning and, and, and leverage that across all the various things that we're trying to do in this diversity and inclusion space. And so it is something that we as a region should be tremendously proud of. Of course, we have much more work to do, but we literally rank uh, number one in the nation for growing as a percentage, larger scale minority businesses. That's great. And I think, um, th thank you, Darren. And I think it's, it's, uh, it goes without saying that uh, you and, and everybody involved in the accelerator are responsible for that and um, that the work's not close to being done. Obviously, we all believe we can do better. And that's, and so that leads to, um, I think, what could be a good discussion around the fact that the accelerator has basically served as a sort of unfunded equity and debt sponsor for these companies over the last 17 years or so. And you're now embarking upon some exciting uh, changes with, to, to help the accelerator get some scale on that effort. And so maybe now's a good time to introduce that. Absolutely, absolutely. Very, very exciting time here for sure. So um, to build on Patrick's point just a tad, um, when we think about some of the core work of the accelerator over the years, a big part of that is, is preparation and readiness for capital and new business and things of that nature. And so we spend a lot of time taking pretty deep dives into companies, looking at financial statements, cash flow projections, and all the different things that are required to prepare folks for funding. We have uh, primarily, however, uh, after that readiness work, uh, have been escorted or introduced entrepreneurs to capital providers, but we are excited that uh, coming in 2021, we are actually looking to uh, create uh, a fund of our own, if you will, um, that we are super excited about. And so this will be an opportunity, uh, and this, this is actually targeting uh, $100 million. Uh, this is a super exciting effort whereby it is looking to bring uh, risk-based capital. So when we talk about um, debt versus equity, this is more on the equity side of, of the transaction, if you will. Equity and debt, and I could honestly spend an entire session on the difference and, and the disparities. I heard uh, one of the uh, stats mentioned in a prior um, a talk here this morning, the the uh, less than 1% of venture capital, for example, finding its way to entrepreneurs of color. 
Well, that, that same statistic is, is there and perhaps even worse when you look at the, the later stage of the equity spectrum, which is private equity. So, so what you're talking about here is the kind of capital that grows, uh, that takes risk, if you will, uh, to grow companies. Historically, if one looks at almost every access to capital effort for entrepreneurs of color, it has primarily always been about debt and debt being a risk averse uh, sort of uh, capital source is entirely different from uh, risk oriented equity. And this is also part of the challenge that um, minority entrepreneurs are typically debt heavy and equity light, meaning that uh, especially in economic downturns, minority entrepreneurs suffer disproportionately because regardless of what the economy is doing, loan and interest payments typically have to be made. In an equity environment, that, that, that is patient capital. That capital waits in, in, in terms of the upside. And so we are looking to bring patient equity capital that in part one will invest in some of these acquisitions that I spoke of. And so if we have an entrepreneur um, that's looking to acquire a firm and needs equity capital to make that happen. That's one of the primary focuses that we'll, we will be looking at. Uh, we will be looking at, in many cases, even early stage entrepreneurs that have perhaps raised some seed funding, have some traction, but are having difficulty raising that quote unquote follow on capital series A and beyond, which we see so often. So we, we will also look at that, that sort of next round of, of funding for earlier stage um, entrepreneurs. So this is, again, if I think about a core existing uh, business that, uh, especially in this environment, perhaps they need to make an investment in a new technology platform, need to hire some key personnel, need to make some strategic investments in equipment and machinery, whatever it may be. These are investments that have a future payback. And so that future payback, if you will, brings about an upside. So this, this is all about looking at the upside and future potential and having the kind of risk-based capital that partners with these firms to really create uh, the types of, of scalable firms going forward that um, to frankly take our existing position at the sort of national ranking to a much, much higher level. Great, Darren, thanks. I think there, they're asking us to wrap up here, but thank you very much for sharing the future plan and for everybody on the call. Um, the speakers prior to us have done a really good job uh, making a call to action. And, um, you know, I would just uh, echo that if you, you know, there are a lot of different ways to be involved in this issue. And uh, I chose supporting the accelerator and this fund effort. Um, for a combination of two reasons. You know, one is I had my own personal enough is enough moment earlier this year. And then secondly, with our firm's background, uh, significant background in private capital investing and learning what Darren and the rest of his team at the Accelerator were up to here, we felt we could lean in and support um, building this fund and making help making it of institutional quality. Um, so um, for everybody on the call, thank you so much for listening. If, if you feel like the accelerator is a great way for you personally to lean in on this issue, you know, we welcome the help and support. Thank you, Patrick. Hey, and thank you both Patrick and Darren. Um, I, I will also add, which I think is really important, Darren. Darren and the NBA are doing some great work, as he mentioned, um, this is a unique asset to Cincinnati, and we've seen uh, unbelievable progress. I think the goal is going to be, and to your point, how do we double down, create an investment fund where there's equity to help these businesses grow? We know that that's the biggest challenge with like-sized businesses to grow is access to capital. So um, you have our commitment here at Fifth Third Bank uh, to continue to support you guys in that matter. And again, just great presentation and really look forward to seeing all the great work you guys are going to do in 2021. Thank you, Clef. So next up, we have two individuals who are helping companies lead dramatic change within their workforce. So we have Audrey Treasure is the Executive Director at Workforce Innovation Center at the Cincinnati Chamber. And then we have Liza Smitherman, who is the Vice President of Corporate Strategy at Johnson Construction and a board member of the Workforce Innovation Center. 
Liza and Audrey will tell you how this new center is going to have an incredible impact on dozens of companies and thousands of lives in our region. But first, let me just give a quick little bio of both Liza and Audrey. She first started with Liza, so she joined Johnston Construction in 1998 in partnership with her husband and her first-generation family-owned business. Liza has played a role in developing the driving purpose behind Johnston Construction to create and provide a diversity of opportunities for all. Now celebrating over 20 years in business, her role has expanded as the business has grown. As Vice President of Corporate Strategy, she facilitates the development of growth strategies for Johnston and its subsidiary companies and continues to drive the direction and planning for all aspects of human resource and workforce development. She works at both the local and national level on workforce development initiatives, and her passion in this work has allowed her to serve as a member of the executive committee for a national collaborative project called Business Leaders United for Workforce Partnerships. Locally, she's a member of the advisory board for the Workforce Innovation Center at the Cincinnati Regional Chamber. Thank you, Liza. And then Audrey Treasures, Audrey, joined the Cincinnati Chamber in December of 2018 as VP and Executive Director of Workforce Innovation Center. In her role, she has established a center as a central place to support companies in solving challenges, recruiting new sources of talent, and implementing inclusive capitalism practices within businesses to benefit their, to benefit their organizations and support the people that they employ. She previously served as Senior Director at the Cincinnati Business Committee in the Cincinnati Business, a regional business committee membership organizations comprised of the Cincinnati region's top CEOs. Audrey serves on the board of 4C for Children, on the Selection Advisory Committee for Green Life Fund Cincinnati, as a member of the Center for Employment Opportunities Cincinnati Advisory Committee, and is the treasurer and founding member of School Board School. Please welcome Liza and Audrey. Good morning and thank you Kalaw for that introduction. It is a pleasure for Liza and I to be with you all today and to have a conversation talking more about what we're building at the Workforce Innovation Center here at the Chamber. So I'll take a few minutes and give you a background of where we came from and then Liza and I will dig into some conversation. So similar in a sense to Darren and the Minority Business Accelerator, the Workforce Innovation Center at the Chamber was launched here because of a problem in the region. And the problem many of you will remember uh, was significantly important a few years ago and continues to be problematic in our current economy. And that was that the child poverty rate in Cincinnati was the ha second highest in the nation. We are no longer the second highest, but we still have an, a child poverty rate that is too high. And the Workforce Innovation Center was founded on this idea that children are poor because their families are poor. And we know that their families are poor because they're not making enough money. And they might not be making enough money because they are unemployed or they are underemployed or they're overemployed, meaning they have to work multiple jobs in order to make ends meet. And so we wanted to see companies themselves as a part of the solution because we know that businesses can provide more for people than just a paycheck. And so what we've done is put together a set of consulting services and tangible policy and practice recommendations that companies can implement within their own workforce to help them support their employees, and that can be to be economically stable and economically mobile. And when we were putting all of this together, uh, it was pre-pandemic. It was a low unemployment rate, as you'll all recall. We were focused on companies that had a frontline workforce. And when the pandemic started this spring, uh, it, it threw us into a loop. Did people still care about inclusive practices? Was this something that companies wanted more of? And after the murder of George Floyd, we also started to think about what would our role and responsibility be to connect companies with resources to create equity and inclusion and diversity within their workforces. So we took this approach to figure out how we could do that well. We wanted to create services that are accessible for businesses of all sizes and for employees across the board. Uh, and we no longer have a focus only on those with a frontline workforce. We're working with companies across the region that have highly educated and highly paid employees and we're focused on how we can make practical solutions for companies like those who are on the call today. I'm also really fortunate that we have a board that is run by business leaders because in putting this together, it was clear for the business folks at the start, that this is not to be something like corporate social responsibility. As I think many of our speakers have already described, 
This is something that is an inclusive, in inclusive strategies are an important part of a long-term business strategy for business success. So it's not just an initiative. And this is not just corporate philanthropy. This is something that will help your companies be successful in the long term because your talent, your workforce is your most important asset. So because I'm fortunate to work with a number of great business leaders, I have an advisory board and Liza Smitherman is one of them. She runs Johnson Construction, as you've heard, and I'm also pleased to say that Johnson Construction is one of the companies that we're working with this year. So I'd like to now introduce Liza and have Liza tell us a little bit more about Justin. Thank you, Audrey and Kala. Thank you also for the introduction. And I'm really happy to be a part of um, this discussion in this panel today. Like you, Kala, this is my first time to participate in this. And I'm, um, I've been quite impressed with the information and what I've been hearing and learning from other speakers thus far. So as Kala mentioned in my introduction, Justin Construction is a family-owned business that my husband and I started over 20 years ago. In fact, we will be approaching our 23rd anniversary early next year. Um, we started the business with the, um, uh, the end in mind of just what Kala, you mentioned in the introduction about our why to create and provide a diversity of opportunities for all. Um, being in the construction industry, which is very much majority run, um, we wanted to have a minority business that did just that, that um, offered opportunities for folks um, that came from all walks of life, um, from entry level to um, highly skilled uh, professional uh, positions, um, from women, um, um, mothers, as well as fathers, um, and men who wanted to continue to develop and grow professionally. So we are a full service commercial construction company. Um, we work within the Cincinnati tri-state region as well as outside of the region, um, about 150 miles outside of Cincinnati in that radius. So we have um, folks who are part of our, our workforce with expertise all across um, the, the Cincinnati tri-state area. Thank you, Liza. So I hope you don't mind. This has been a theme that has come up throughout the morning that uh, in talking about some of these issues, vulnerability is an important aspect. And so I want to start right off by asking you, what are some of your biggest challenges that you're facing right now and then the opportunities you see for your workforce? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I, I would, would say that just as you mentioned prior to the pandemic, um, the unemployment rate was down. Um, you know, across most um, industries, but in our industry in particular, um, our pipeline of folks that would, who wanted to be part of the industry, the construction industry was down. And so we were experiencing and have been experiencing shortages in workforce and talent. Um, then add to that the fact that um, the work that we do, which we are both a specialty contractor where we are very labor intensive, as well as we manage work um, as, a, as a construction manager and a general contractor, um, that the work that we do can be lab very labor intensive and difficult. And there was a time in the last you know, 15 to 20 years where folks were, were being redirected from looking at um, the trades and, and pursuing um, secondary education and college um, 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 certifications and diplomas, but not everybody wanted to do that. Um, but yet they were not being encouraged to, to pursue other types of um, um, career opportunities. So our biggest challenge has been workforce and talent. And then once we find and get those folks, then it's about how do we retain them? Because we have entry level positions all the way up to very professional roles. Um, and, but it's very, very important when people don't have the skills they need to do the work that is needed. Um, that then their wages can be low. And as we've heard um, and are very much aware of, um, having jobs that are good, that it's one thing to have a job, but when you have to have, to have two or three in order to maintain and manage and take care of yourself and your family, that's a problem. So for us, it's the challenge of not only recruiting and retaining, but also making sure we're providing um, opportunities for upskilling and development so that our people can um, live and experience um, work and, 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 and the, this inclusive capitalism piece um, is, is felt um, each and every day by every person that is part of our organization. Thank you. And I will say, I think many companies on the line would probably uh, acknowledge that s employers are still having difficulty finding people. It's a pain point that we've been hearing from many of our companies that they cannot still find the people that they need. 
-hmm. So one thing I'd like to highlight is some of the services that the center is providing and have Eliza tell us more about why she is engaging in those. So the Workforce Innovation Center offers three services and companies can do them a la carte or can do them all together. One is an employee survey that uh, seeks to understand not only the employee's experience at work, but also how some of their personal experiences might be affecting their ability to go to work successfully. So for example, my daughter is at school age and is not in school every day, which affects my ability to always be prepared and able to go to work. But that's true also in a more significant manner. People are uh, on the brink of foreclosures and evictions. People are not having the ability to find food. And so we know that employers want to understand more about their employees' experiences and step in to provide resources if they can. One of the second things we do is offer a, a service with partnership called Working Metrics. It was born out of the Aspen Institute in an effort they called the Good Jobs Strategy. And it focuses on job quality and job equity. How can we help people have more data about their workforce to make goals and to make changes? And so we want to be able to offer that to other employers so that you can set ambitious goals for yourselves and then track your progress over time. And the third thing that we're offering is a comprehensive review of policies and practices because several companies uh, that we've spoken with over the last two years since we founded the center have indicated they need to understand better how their policies and practices may be supporting or inadvertently harming uh, how they, they can attract and retain a diverse workforce. We've been fortunate then to create a set of solutions for companies that we can offer in terms of revised policies and practices and partnerships with local organizations who could help serve business needs. This was born out of the Women's Fund Employer Toolkit. There are many organizations in town that are great social service agencies that can solve these needs and other resources, even the uh, inclusive toolkit that Fifth Third has put together is a great resource that we can share with others. So Liza, could you tell us why you're working with the Workforce Innovation Center, what you hope to achieve by working with us? Sure. Um, again, I think that for us as a minority business, again, we totally get and understand what diversity, equity, and inclusion is about and how even the work that we do each and every day impacts the people who work for us, no matter who they are, what they look like, or what their backgrounds are. But we have to be very strategic. We have to be very intentional about, again, hearing from our employees because you get in a business and and you want to make money, um, you want to continue to grow your business, but we can't do that if we don't have a workforce and people that are part of our team that can help us do that. We, we don't work in silos, we need the team. And we can make assumptions about what those needs are and what is best for our employees. But what we um, have decided to do um, is to, again, continue to, one of our values is the best at getting better and to utilize the resources that you just named, Audrey, that the center offers to really help us take a, a a hard look at and a very close look at what we are currently doing, what we know and think and believe is working, but what also we may be able to do differently um, to challenge kind of what the status quo has been and to say, let's see what else, let's, let's look at what are some other opportunities that we can have to not only impact our business growth, but really it's about impacting our people so that then that, that growth that we're looking for will actually happen and continue to, to, to uh, um, to sustain the business that we have and want to continue to move forward with. Thank you. So as we consider everything we've heard today from all these tremendous speakers, and we talk about this being the diversity leadership symposium, I'm wondering what some of your thoughts are around takeaways that you think might help companies drive the systemic change within their own businesses. You know, what I would say is that I think that um, as we have all experienced so much in this year of 2020, and as I think about what the Workforce Innovation Center is doing and how it's really for us and for any business, and I would challenge any business to consider and look at the center as a, as a place, um, as a resource for what really your true intentions are um, I think that as business leaders in particular, that we really have to look at what do we want? So um, as, as it pertains to um, diversity, equity, inclusion, what does that really mean? And it's not just checking the box, but how do we not continue to just check the box? And I think that it's having a true, clear, personal understanding and, 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 and discussion with ourselves about what do we really want? Um, as leaders of our organization, because yes, we all work for 
are for businesses or we lead businesses, um, but we are the leaders of those businesses. And so um, it sometimes, you know, we can either say we're at the top and it flows down or we're at the bottom holding up the organization and where we want that organization to go, where the foundation. And so I think it's important that we challenge ourselves initially and say, what do I think I really know about about business, about work, about growth, um, about the bottom line, and how do we get there? Um, I think we need to educate ourselves. And we've heard from a lot of folks on this on this call. There's so many resources out there that we can utilize. That's what the center is just one of those many resources that can really help you look at some very specific things within your business um, that you mentioned around. And, and it's data collection. I mean, we're all for, we're business people and, and data should drive what we do. Well, there's a lot of data out there that we collect each and every day. And um, if we don't like what we see, we make changes. Um, I think that I challenge our leaders to say, there's, there's data out here where this, symposium is happening for a reason. And if you're not sure, you don't trust it, go out and look for and gather the information and then compile that data and then make some decisions. Um, no differently than you would as part of a business plan to grow your business, we need to grow in this, in this space as well to be more inclusive and to make sure that we are furthering the growth development uh, of all. We need our workforce. We need people. Um, we don't do this all by ourselves. And what you just said reminds me of uh, a phrase, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know who to, to whom uh, to attribute it. It is what gets measured gets done. Mm -hmm. And inclusion and diversity and equity, and even things like economic mobility are items that companies have control over. And if we set, we have things to use to measure where we are, and we can look at progress over time, we can see really sustainable change and be able to talk about what that means quantitatively but also right. what that means then qualitatively for people's lives and Absolutely. what that means for the workforce. So I really appreciate that call out. And that is what we hope to do through the, the services at the Workforce Innovation Center. Mm -hmm. So I think we're getting to the end of our moment here. I want to thank Liza for joining us and invite other companies who might be interested in working with the center, exploring what we, how we might be able to support you in growing uh, to please visit our site at workforceinnovationcenter.com and let us know how we can help. Thank you. Liza and Audrey, uh, Liza, particularly with Justin, we're so so blessed to have a company that is committed to this effort. So again, thank you guys for all the great work that you're doing, and as well, Audrey, with the center. Uh, workforce development is the next frontier. Darren talked about entrepreneurship and growing businesses, but if we're going to close the wealth gap, workforce development has to be a major pillar that we're focused on. So thank you both again for joining us today, and I will turn it back over uh, to our event coordinators. Thank you.